Hello everybody and welcome to this Cooper Smith Career Consulting Study Guide Crash Course. This is for the course of Fundamentals in Management. We are going to be discussing various aspects regarding management in general. At the completion of the course we're going to expect you to be able to do things regarding management of a company. Obviously we're not going to be able to give you much practical experience. What we are going to do is in order to try to simulate the practical environment, which management obviously is, we're first going to have to we're still we're going to teach you the concepts, but we're also going to go through a lot of case studies. And the case studies are going to try to simulate the real life environment and they're going to try to give you an idea of you know the sort of ways that these management concepts that we're learning about can be applied. Uh, there will be a final examination at the end of this course. It will be graded on a scan standard 1 to 100 uh, scale. There is a textbook that's recommended. You can see all this. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail because it all is in the uh, is in the study guide that you have access to. Of course, if you want to print out the study guide, this is about 150 slides long. Maybe you don't want to waste 150 pages. There is a uh, guide to printing out this study guide in not 150 pages, it's only in, in about one quarter of that. And to try to print out the slides uh, in under 40 pages. So you can look at that. This is something that we put in many of our study guides and you will have the opportunity to do, print that out when you like. So let's go ahead and look at chapter one. Chapter one is understanding the manager's job trying to make sure that we just kind of have an overview of what managers do and how they operate. And what a manager does is a manager is involved in managing people under his or her level in an organization. An organization is any group of people working together in a regulated and coordinated fashion to achieve a set of goals. Family, business, army, social services, charitable organization, nonprofit organization, school, I mean, there are lots and lots of different types of organizations, and virtually all types of organizations require some level of management. A family requires management, a business requires management, a corporation, all of these things require some level of management. In a family, it's the head of the household, or the heads of the household, if you have a married couple, hopefully. Somebody's in charge of paying the bills. In a business, you also have a head and somebody who's in charge of paying the bills. In a business, that's called the CEO, or the chief executive officer, who is in charge of running the country, company and making the specific important decisions. And then you have the CFO, who is the chief financial officer, who's involved in making, or is in charge of making, the financial decisions and spending the company's resources. Now, there are many other officers that may be involved in an organization, and they're all managers. You could have the chief operating officer, you could have the vice president, president, many vice presidents, you could have people in charge of this aspect or people in charge of that aspect, and all of these people are managers. And that really begs the question, okay, what is a manager? A manager is someone who engages in activities like decision making, organizing, leading, and controlling. Decision making, of course, is determining what the. We're going to talk about a company. Obviously, this also applies to things like families and nonprofit organizations, but we're going to talk about it in the context of, of a company. So, making decisions, organizing, in other words, determining which people in the company work on which goals, leading the people, and of course, controlling the individuals, making sure that they do what they're supposed to be doing. And that also includes using the organization's resources the things that the organization can use to further its goals. Resources include human resources, those are the employees, the people who work for the company. Financial resources, the spending that the company can do of whatever capital it has. The physical resources, things like its building and its plant, its inventory, and the information that the company has access to. And management also includes achieving organizational goals in as effect efficient and effective a manner as possible, trying to spend as little time and money and resources as possible to accomplish the goal. And a manager is the person whose responsibility is to carry out that process. A manager could be a very broad manager or it could be a very a manager of a very small, a small project. A manager plans and makes decisions, organizes, leads, and controls the resources of the company, which is what we discussed at the top of the slide as well. Management includes several sub-areas. There was an entire course on marketing, but marketing is really just a sub-field 
of management because managing includes managing the marketing of the company. That includes marketing the product or service run by marketing directors, but it's part of the overall management structure of the company. There is managing the decisions of the company, the CFO, the controller, the accounting part. There is the operations of the company, the COO, the chief operations officer, the people who run the day-to-day -day affairs of the company, the way in which the employees operate, etc. Human resources, who are the people who run the employees and make sure that the company has the employees that are able to fulfill its operations and fulfill its roles. And this is run by supervisors in your company's HR department. Uh, and then you have the administrative management, people who administrate the company's activities on a day-to-day -day basis. And you might have specialized management, specialists who are brought in to manage particular aspects of the company's business. Management includes theory and also a level of understanding and utilizing past experience, which is history. Management theory provides a conceptual framework for organizing knowledge and a blueprint, which means a general, we're going to be talking a lot about theory during this course, which is the ideas that go behind successful marketing and how they can be operated. And of course, many of these are still applicable today, and we're going to be learning about many of them. History also includes an understanding of historical developments and an awareness and understanding of mistakes that were made in the past. Certainly, all managers make mistakes at one point or another. The question is whether they are going to learn from their mistakes and try to avoid those mistakes in the future. Like virtually every other type of quantity, you can measure management in quantitative or qualitative terms. Quantitative is anything that can be defined by a number. You know, I have $25, that's a quantity. I have that number of objects. There's also qualitative. Something could be of higher quality. You know, one person could have uh, 25 forks and the other person could have three forks, but the three forks could be better than the, 20, twin the 25. Forks may be a little bit of a silly example, but you get the idea. Qualitative is the quality, how good something is. Quantitative is the number. So a quantitative management field is our management fields that can be measured with some level of mathematical precision. So quantitative management fields includes things like focuses on the development of mathematical models, which assist with decision making, things like how much has to be spent over the course of a year in order to develop this product, things like how much money has to be spent on advertising in order to get a certain number of people to buy the product, etc. It's also operations management, which is also some, on some level a quantitative field sort of the idea of how many employees you need to tackle a certain problem, how much money you have to pay employees in order to entice them to work on a particular problem, things like that. And so the quantitative approach to management, which obviously is not the entire picture of management, but it's certainly an element of it, focuses on the use of computers, mathematical models, decision making, and economic effectiveness. These things can and must be used as at least part of the calculus for a manager. You know, how much money do we have to work with? How many employees do we have to work with? What's my budget on this particular project? What is the likelihood in terms of how much I'm going to have to spend on advertising to get people to buy this product? What's the likelihood in terms of how many employees I'm going to have to run for how many months in order to finish this product? All of these things are quantitative decisions, and obviously... Managers also have to look at the qualitative fields. Managers have to look at other things besides quantity, but quantity is certainly at least an element. Let's look at managers by level, classifying managers. You have top managers, you have middle managers, and then you have the lower managers. They're still not the people that are the lower part of the company. The people who are on the lower end of the company are typically the people who are working on the assembly lines, you know, the individual workers who aren't managers at all. I remember uh, New York Tel or AT&T in the old days, or 9X in the old days, um, used to have eight levels of managers. So they were all managers. They were all, you know, higher than the people who went around and, and, and fixed the telephones. But uh, they were certainly on, they were on eight different levels. And there were a lot of ones and fewer twos and fewer threes and fewer fours all the way up to eight. When eight was the top level, there were only a handful of them. So you could have marketers by area also. 
marketing, human resources, financial, administrative, operations, specialist. We've all looked at that before on previous slides. But the idea is and you can see this is kind of a pyramid where you have lower level managers and managers that are specialists, management that op that's, uh, specialize in a particular area. And then you have higher level managers which manage all of these areas. You know, the COO, for example, is a very high level, but the COO and the CFO are both under the CEO because the CEO is a general manager, whereas the CFO is specific to finance. Okay, so um, managers can also be both. Managers can can wear different hats, so to speak. One person can be a director and a CFO, or a CEO and the chairman of the board of directors. In other words, you're not confined to one type of manager. You can have many different types of managerial roles. Uh, so, for example, this one person who's both on the board of directors and the CFO would be on the board of directors, which is certainly a very high level manager. It's really the highest level manager in a company because the board of directors run the company. And then there's the CFO, the person who's in, well, that same person could be in charge of financial audits. A person can be both vice president of a company and a marketing director. A, the level of management would be vice president, which is the next level under the president. The specific area in which the person manages would be marketing. And again, same idea as before, top managers are executives who manage the overall goals and strategy of the policies. The middle managers implement the goals set by the top managers. You know, top managers say, okay, you know, we're going to produce a new car this year. Well, the middle managers are actually the ones that work on the ideas on how to go about doing that and are the ones that, that you know, establish the plans and establish the procedures. Then the lower managers or the first line managers supervise the people who are actually doing the work. In the second chapter, we're going to look at the environment of organizations and their managers. We're still not getting too much into the nitty gritty, but we're looking at the environment in which they work in general. The general environment is broad dimensions and forces an organization surrounding that determine, excuse me, forces in an organization surrounding that determine the overall context of the environment. In English, what that means is, you know, what, how do they operate? Do they operate in a very low budget? Do they operate with a tremendous amount of money to work with? Do they operate with a thousand people working under them? Do they operate with nobody working under them? Managers could be any of these, and all of these included are included in the idea of the environment. There are political legal aspects, which is the legal system in which the company operates. In some companies, the legal system might be irrelevant. In some companies, things like antitrust and other companies, you know, that oil companies, things like that, energy producers, utilities might be subject to a lot of regulation. There's also the idea of the political stability of the company. Is it the sort of thing that uh, you know that does that serves products that may uh, be made illegal or that the government may want to regulate? That's the a sort of issue that managers have to worry about as well. Uh, Pro-business versus anti-business sentiment surrounding the company. Is it a company like Walmart that people like to criticize, uh, or is it a company that uh, people are very friendly to? Technological dimension. Is it the sort of company that has to worry about always being state-of-the-art and other people outflanking them with inventions? And is it, what's the economic dimension? Is this the sort of company that's doing well based on the current environment? Let's look at our first case study, and we're going to be looking at a lot of these throughout the course. And this, the, the idea here is to try to look at these case studies in the context of how they apply to the concepts that we're going to learn in this course. ExxonMobil, as you probably know, is a firm that operates uh, gas stations and oil drilling uh, uh, and oper operates under the United States legal system. It drills in many oil-rich countries. The political dimension, which we just discussed, is of course a very important component for a company like ExxonMobil. First of all, they drill in a lot of countries where there is political unrest. They may drill in the Middle East, they may drill in South American countries, countries that don't have a lot of political stability. These are issues, the, based on political unrest, the price of oil itself and the cost of drilling may go up or down. Then you have to look at the legal system, like the American Environmental Protection Agency, which regulates drilling. Regulates drilling based on the kinds of things like what kind of safety mechanisms are used, how much drilling can be done, where drilling can be done, things like that. ExxonMobil also has to worry about 
are people in favor of drilling more or based on you know global warming issues or based on environmental issues based on oil dependency issues are people looking to fund things like nuclear energy and uh, solar energy wind energy which obviously if people start focusing more on that it could hurt exxon mobil's business if, if all the cars or most of the cars that we drove became hybrids or became uh, you know nissan, nissan leafs that are electric cars well exxon mobil of course wouldn't do as well because there wouldn't be as much demand for their services so all of these factors will determine their general environments. Some of, the, for example, the best thing that it can hope for in these areas, if people are pro-drilling and using oil as a source of energy, and that fluctuates. Certainly there are a lot of people that are always pro-drilling and a lot of people that would rather get alternative energy, but certainly that fluctuates where, at, depending on the political outlook and depending on the economy, people will look at it in different ways from time to time. Obviously they also would like there, there not to be such political unrest um, in these oil-rich company countries, excuse me, uh, and or if there is, that at least costs. I'm going to change this word to costs of drilling don't go up because if costs of drilling do go up, then Exxon Mobil has to pay a higher cost to drill. Also, I mean, also it, the truth is, and uh, price of oil, yeah, because we don't, you know, it may not be obvious, but Exxon Mobil, you would think the more it, the more uh, gasoline is worth, the more Exxon Mobil makes. That's not always necessarily true, because that also means that fewer people are going to buy gasoline. There, there, less gasoline is going to sell, and it also means that when Exxon buys oil from other, uh, you know, countries and from other people that drill, they have to pay more. And also, U.S. environmental protection laws can interfere, and so that their best environment would be a situation in which U.S. environmental protection laws do not make drilling for oil too costly. Another aspect of organizations or the, polit or the environment are ethics. And in ethics means a person's beliefs regarding what is right and what is wrong. Ethical behavior in general means what is acceptable to other people and what conforms to social norms, whereas unethical behavior is unacceptable to others, does not conform to social norms, things that may be looked at as stealing or things that may be looked at as behavior that takes materials away from other people wrongfully browsing social media during company time, borrowing office supplies for personal use, these things that, you know, may not necessarily be illegal, but are, you know, are unethical and could hurt somebody's business image, of course. Things that determine ethics include, obviously, family influences, how you grew up, determines dramatically how you view ethics in the workplace and in life in general, the situation, your personal values and morals, your personal experiences, and what other people tell you. Ethical decision-making in general has a lot of steps to it. One thing is, obviously, if there's a question about whether something is ethical or not, there are some things that you have to look at. For example, is it the best for all the people involved? Does it respect the rights of, and the, the responsibilities of the other people who are involved in the decision? Is it fair? Is it consistent with your responsibility to care about other people? And what this, what this level is, obviously, if something is unethical, or at least has some level, I'm sorry, has some level that indicates that it's unethical, maybe it's not 100% fair, maybe it doesn't necessarily care about other people, but it can still be outweighed by its good. Producing something that, uh, you know, that may, you know, paying people lower than acceptable wages might be acceptable if it's necessary to produce this object uh, that's going to be better for the world. Or, uh, you know, borrowing materials that, that don't belong to you may be justified if it's going to save lives. I mean, these are just things that need to be taken into account when determining whether something is ethical. A concept related to that is the concept of social responsibility, which businesses may or may not consider part of their responsibility. Social responsibility is obligations that the organization has to protect and enhance in the social context in which it functions. These include the stakeholders. Do you as a manager owe a responsibility to your owners, to the people who own your company, to the shareholders? Well, the answer to that is yes, you do. 
you also owe responsibility to the environment, to the natural environment and the social environment, which means the good of people in general, making sure not to use child labor, violations of human rights, things like that, maybe giving company money to charity, help, having the company fund things that are good for people in general. Corporate social responsibility is another important concept in management. It's not always 100% clear whether the company has a responsibility to be resp socially responsible, or some people will tell you that the company's only responsibility is to their shareholders, and uh, their shareholders you know, want the stock price to go up and don't care about anything else, but then there are some people who will tell you that you also have a responsibility to society in general. And the way to satisfy this corporate responsibility, social responsibility, to the extent that it exists, includes operating a business in a way that protects social and environmental factors, developing policies that incorporate responsible practices, and trying to report on progress made toward being more socially responsible. And responsibility includes many different areas. Governance, ethics, opportunity and training, hiring workers, responsible management of the entire company, and making sure that your company doesn't have a negative energy or environmental impact. Now, as we can see, there is kind of a debate, which was what this is about. Uh, the debate here is whether social responsibility really is a responsibility of people, or whether it's not the responsibility of the company to be socially responsible. Um, arguments for social responsibility includes the fact that businesses create problems for society, they ought to try to help them. Corporations are citizens and therefore owe responsibility to other people. Businesses have the resources, have a lot of money, and can help solve these problems. And businesses are a partner in society. The better things work out for society, the better, in the long run, businesses will do. Arguments against it are that the idea of business is to generate profits for the shareholders. Or, interestingly enough, Involvement in social ideas might give businesses too much power. There's conflicts of interest if the businesses decides that its responsibility is to make people behave better. And also the idea that the business may lack the expertise to decide what is considered socially and morally praiseworthy. So these, these are just some interesting opposite arguments about whether businesses have a responsibility to behave ethically or whether their only responsibility is to the shareholders. Okay, let's move on to international business activity, which is, of course, a subset of the management of any big company. And here are some of the, there's a whole course that we offer on international businesses, in international business, but let's take a look at some of the uh, general management activities that go along with international business. Importing and exporting is bringing goods into your company or country or sending goods to a different country. Direct investment is when a firm headquartered in one country builds or, or builds or purchases operating facilities in another country. For example, if I'm an American beer company and I purchase a beer manufacturer in the Netherlands to make beer to then import back into the United States, what I'm doing is I'm making a direct investment into the Netherlands. Licensing. When I allow a foreign company to manage, to manufacture or market the product using the firm's brand name, trademark technology, patent, or any kind of intellectual property that I own. If I own a, a company that makes cell phones and I call them, uh, I don't know, uh, Google or, you know, what, let's, let's say, for example, the Android operating system, or let's say Google, let's say Google goes and turns around and hires a factory in Japan to make products and to put the name Google on it. Maybe they give them the information on how to do it. They give them marketing strategies. They give them like a franchise. Uh, I have, uh, you know, I have Starbucks. And so some company, some uh, company in France opens up a coffee shop and calls it uh, and some company in, excuse me, I have Starbucks and some company and I hire some or I license out uh, some coffee shop in France to call themselves Starbucks and to, I give them the recipes, I give them the marketing advice, I give them whatever Starbucks has. That's an example of licensing. They license a franchise out. Well, franchising is really a type of licensing. And of course, you can have strategic alliances and joint ventures where co companies in different countries get together and pool their resources to try to establish a new, a new, new goods or services. 
Here are some advantages and disadvantages. Importing and exporting is when you make the goods yourself and in, or, or you sell the goods yourself. The advantages are that it doesn't cost a whole lot. You don't have to do business with another, with another country. You just buy what you want or sell what you want. The, the risk, of course, first of all, you have tariffs and taxes. Companies, some, countries sometimes uh, assess a tax on goods that are moved in and out of the country. Government restrictions, high transportation costs. Licensing, where you give somebody the ability to make and sell your product. It doesn't cost you a lot in terms of making the product in the first place. Somebody else does it. But on the other hand, it's, there is inflexibility in it. That other person is the one that's going to control the production and sale of that product. Strategic alliances and joint ventures, I can make a deal with a foreign co company. Well, that's good because it allows you to get into that business right away and access materials and technology that that company owns. But on the other hand, you don't have ownership of that element of the business. Somebody else does. And direct investment, when you hire, you hire a factory or you buy a factory in that country, well, you have a lot of control, and you get the infrastructure, but there's a lot of risk. You have to pay a lot of money, and it's a little bit less certain. Here's another case study where we're going to be looking at some of these concepts over here. The Spectacle Workshop is a small business that sells high-end eyeglasses, contact lenses, and related products. Some of them are American-made, but many of them are designed in Europe and other places. The owner has many options for increasing business, including inter international branches. Based on these four possibilities, here are how you would apply these to our scenarios. You could import glasses from one or more places. You know, you can go to England or you can go to Italy or whatever it is, and you can uh, import the glasses from there and then turn around and sell them. The disadvantage, of course, is you have to pay for transportation and you have to pay for government import taxes or export taxes as they exist. You could expand the business to include exporting. You can make your glasses here and then sell them to other countries. But again, government restrictions and, and tariffs have to be dealt with. You can license to a foreign company. In other words, you can make a deal. You can buy a factory in Italy to make eyeglasses for you. Increase profitability, but again, it takes a lot of money to lay out. You can join with, join with other eyeglass merchants in other countries in strategic alliance, and that will allow increased profitability for both. But again, the disadvantage is that it means splitting the profits, and of course, you could have a conflict in management between the two sides. Chapter 3 is about planning and strategic management, an overall goal, an overall way of looking at things, managing holistically from the top of the company down. And the first thing that involves any uh, that in, that is involved in any strategic management is an organizational plan. That includes a strategic plan, which means a general overall strategy for the company. What are you going to produce? When are you going to produce it? Where are you going to move? Where are you going to sell? Where are you going to hire? All of these things that uh, are part of a strategic plan. Resource allocation priorities action steps to achieve a strategic goal. All of these things, of course, are relevant. Then you have tactical plans. Tactical plans are plans of how you're actually going to execute. Strategic plan is, you know, what do you want to do? And tactical plan is how do you want to get there? These are really for middle management, the people who manage the people on the ground. And they're designed to achieve tactical goals set by, uh, by middle management. And what example would be using stock in a bank line for the acquisition of another company. If you decide you want to expand in an area by buying another company, well, you need to get the financing in order to buy that company. Then there are operational plans. Operational plans are on-the-ground plans, how you're actually going to build it on the ground. This is for lower-level lower level management. These are the people that are actually running the show on the floor of the assembly line or, uh, you know, the actual salespeople who are going to go out and sell. This, of course, has to have a short-term focus. And one example would be a last option or a last uh, you know a last step in the plan getting the board of directors approval pur for purchasing the company that would be something that's you know the strategic plan is okay we want to get the company b the tactical plan would be how are we going to buy the company how are we going to get the funding how are we going to uh, get involved and then getting the final permissions is the operational plan. Also something like uh, how to manage the assembly line to build, uh, you know, build a certain number of cars in a day. That would be an example of an operational plan. So you've got, again, this is just a quick 
summary over here. You've got strategic goals, tactical goal, the goals, and operational goals. And each one of those has to come with a plan. You have a strategic goal, you know, you want to make a million dollars this year. Okay, you know, how are we going to make a million dollars this year? You know, we're going to sell X number of widgets. Tactical goals. Uh, okay, uh, that the way in which we're going to make a, sell, uh, you know, sell a million widgets, the way we're going to make a million dollars is by selling uh, X number of widgets in 23 different stores in four different states. And then you have a plan on how to do that. And the operational would be, you know, who are you going to hire to make the sales? And who are you going to, on the ground, who's going to run the tactical goals and the tactical uh, way of doing things? Here's another one of these case studies, again, that we're going to be looking in on throughout the course. We've got XYZ Airlines that has developed a strategic plan for expanding its passenger service to the Middle East. And so here are some examples of what would be a strategic plan and what would be a tactical plan. A strategic plan would be something like how to follow government re regulations, how, to, how many gates to rent, maintenance, a cost-profit analysis. That's a very important strategic, uh, strategic plan, strategic part of the plan. You have to figure out whether it's worth it, you know, whether you're going to make money actually doing this, buying new equipment, advertising. Then the tactical plans would be, okay, you know, we've made a decision that we're going to rent four gates at, uh, you know, Ben Gurion Airport or whatever. Well, okay, you know, which gates? Uh, which, uh, you know, which specific way, how do we negotiate this? Etc. Then you have something like hiring new pilots, airline crew, then, of course, not on this slide, but you'd have the operational plans. Uh, something Actually, this area, hiring new pilots, airline crew, might uh, actually hiring the ground crew would probably be more like under the, uh, under the operational plan, would be at the very end. So, you know, those are the three different levels. They're not always 100% clear which uh, action falls into which plan, but that's basically the three levels. Strategy is overall what the company is doing. Tactical, how the company plans to get there. And operational, the nuances on how you're going to execute that vision. The next part of the chapter is kind of a, a little bit of a new topic over here. We've got the generic competitive strategies from Porter. This is the idea of how do you compete? How do you gain an advantage over your competitors? And there are a few different possibilities. There are a few different ways to do it. One is differentiation which is to use the quality of your products or services or your message to differentiate yourself from your competitors, you know, claiming that you're better than all others or that you're friendlier than all others or that you're the most environmentally friendly among all others, whatever, however you want to differentiate yourself. Overall cost leadership strategy, which attempts to gain a competitive advantage by reducing overall costs below the cost of competing firms. In other words, what you want to try to do is maybe sell the same stuff, maybe not differentiate your product, but differentiate your prices, being able to offer the lowest price and the customer the best value. And finally, a focus strategy, which concentrates on a particular group of buyers, maybe not necessarily having the best price, maybe not necessarily having the best product, but having the best product for a particular niche in the market for a particular segment. Targeting a line of food products to those with gluten allergies, allergies might help. Here are some examples of corporate level strategies. Different, these are just examples of strategies that you might, if you produce products, you produce office products, you produce cars, you produce whatever it is that you produce, you could have a single product strategy where you just have one product and try to do it better than anybody else. You could have related di diversification. You make different products in the same industry. You know, you make laptops and then you also make keyboards and mice and you also make monitors and things like that it diversifies but they're all in related industry and then there's unrelated diversification where you have diversification in completely different areas companies like Procter and Gamble which have uh, cheese and chocolate and uh, laundry detergent and things like that which obviously have very little uh, very little to do with each other and one of those, of course, is related diversification. That was the middle level. The outer two are kind of obvious in terms of what they are. Single product strategy, you only offer one product. Unrelated diversification is you offer products in totally, totally different areas. And related diversification, that middle one, is a strategy in which, organization, in which an organization operates in several different businesses that are linked. An airline company has a fleet of planes, and they build the planes, and they fly the people around the country. And maybe they offer other things, too, like 
entertainment on the plane, uh, selling food on the plane, things like that. You know, that might be an example of related diversification, as opposed to unrelated diversification, where they would uh, they would also make uh, make cars and sell them separately. Uh, here, the advantages, of course, of related diversification is that you reduce risk because if one of your products get hurt then at least you have the other ability to, uh, you know, the other, if, you're, if one of your markets gets hurt, at least the other market might, might compensate for that. Creation of economies of scale and scope, little bit, things are, that are a little bit broader than your initial line of product, and synergistic sharing and strength of competencies. Related diversification, you can cross-market which means once you're offering one, you offer the other with it. You know, Microsoft oper operating an, uh, offering an operating system, namely Windows, and also offering Microsoft Word, you know, an office suite like Excel, Word, PowerPoint, whatever, is synergistic because they can feed off each other. The operating system can be built specifically to help Word, and Word can be built specifically to operate within the operating system. The disadvantage of related diversification, of course, when one industry gets hurt, both businesses will get hurt because they are related to each other. If you're an airline and you sell food on the plane, uh, or then and the both businesses are going to be hurt if fewer people are flying. Also, widespread diversification tends to reduce rather than improve profitability because you're focusing on things that are broader and you're working on markets that it is that are harder to get into. Chapter 4 is on managing decision-making, figuring out a way to manage the process of determining what happens to your company and what your company does and how well your company does ultimately. Conditions affecting decision-making include decision-making certainty, risk, or uncertainty. Certainty is when you pretty much know, I guess you can never have 100% certainty, but you can pretty much know what's going to happen. You can be not sure, or you can really be unsure if you're talking about uncertainty. Risk is, you know, where you think it's going to happen, but there's a chance that it won't work out, and uncertainty really essentially means you really have no idea. Now, there are programmed decisions, and there are non-programmed decisions. Programmed decisions are decisions that are structured and that re decisions that appear with some, with some frequency. In other words, they happen over and over again. Program decisions have certain environments, which means, one, the information is available, and there's a p low probability of a bad decision. Well, starting your car in the morning is a very, 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 very programmed decision. It doesn't take a lot of thought, doesn't take a lot of uh, decision making. It just, you know, put the key in the ignition and you turn. That's like, an, I guess, a, an absurd example almost of, an, of a programmed decision. Non-programmed decision is unstructured. It's uncertain. You're not sure what's going to happen. These occur much less frequently, and they are risky, or they're uncertain. They're not programmed. You're not sure exactly what's going to happen when you make the decision. And one reason why they may be risky or uncertain is because you don't have all the information available, or the situation is ambiguous. Choosing a vacation destination once for a once a year vacation is a non-programmed decision. Now, if you already have a, uh, you know, if you already have a, um, you know, a, a timeshare set up in California and you know, in Long Beach, California, whatever it is, and you're going to go to that, well, then it may be less programmed. You don't have a lot of uncertainty. You have what you have. But when you're talking about uh, something that is more programmed, when you're talking about something that, I'm sorry, is less programmed, where you're not sure where to go and you're not sure whether one is going to be better or worse or more expensive or less expensive. Expensive, that would be a decision that is definitely less programmed. Program decisions rely on rules, past experience, calculated results, statistical models, the computer tells you what's going to happen. Program decisions are very often made in the short term, day by day basis, and they can be made by low level managers or by individuals working on the assembly line. You know, whether to shut the assembly line down for a minute while the you know while the machines cool off is not something that you need the CEO to get involved in. It's an everyday decision that's made by people that have the experience and know whether you have to do it. Non program decisions, on the other hand, require intuition and creativity, things that are not on a day-to-day -day basis, things that you might not have the experience to know exactly what's going to happen. And these are often used to make long-term strategy decisions and are made by upper-level management. Managers use both. Sometimes they use program decisions and sometimes they use non-program decisions. The manager of a pain company may make a program decision to order more inventory in more cans in this case, uh, when the 
inventory runs low. So if that that's that's a very much a program decision. You know you have to order more. If you're a bookstore and you run out of books, you got to order more books. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to sell anything. That's fairly programmed, fairly easy. You have a lot of experience with it. Harder decisions might be whether the company should start selling paint cans directly to homeowners or continue doing it to hardware stores. That's much less certain, much more dependent on a wide variety of factors, on creativity, on uncertainty. Manager of a coffee shop might make a decision to order more straws and coffee stirrers. That's a program decision. You know you need more coffee stirrers, and it's not very risky to order more hot cups, because unless you go out of business, you're always going to need those hot cups no matter what. It's a very easy decision to make. Non-program decision might be whether to buy more tables and expand the sitting area, which costs a lot of money in construction, or takes more store space, or for whatever reason, because you think that's going to have dividends because people are going to enjoy the store more. You know, something to that effect. These are th examples of programmed versus non-programmed decisions. Let's take a look at a case study. We've got Starbucks in a certain mall decided to move the store from the center of the mall to a corner with both an inside and an outside entrance. And he made the decision because the location of the center of the mall was not drumming up enough business, and he wanted to get, have an outside rather than putting it in the middle where people who are inside the mall are the only people who can access it. He wanted to kind of put it on the edge of the mall where people who are outside can also, you know, maybe you're walking in the street or walking, you know, near on nearby area could see the Starbucks and come in. That would be an example of very much a non-programmed decision. You know, the decision to replace the coffee machine because it's not working anymore, that would be programmed. The decision to change your location to one that maybe has less mall traffic but more outside traffic is very much speculative and very much risky. The idea didn't work out in this case. Because even though profits improved, the increased rent and moving cost uh, cut into the profits to the point where it didn't work out. Now again, that's just one particular example, but it's very much a non-programmed decision. The manager needs to evaluate the situation and create a new solution for the problem. So instead of, for example, moving to the corner where you're partly outside the, outside the mall, there are some other things that may have been possible. You could re remain in the location and, and allow time to cover the original cost. You can, in other words, you can remain in the outside location and hope that over the course of years the profits make up for your moving expenses and your increased rent. You can advertise the new location. You can tell people who are maybe looking for it uh, and couldn't find it inside the mall that, you know, put up a sign in the mall that says we're outside. Make a sale to greatly increase the number of customers by lowering price, drawing people in, you can move back to the original location. That's one possibility. Move right outside the mall. In other words, you can instead of instead of trying to get foot traffic by being half inside and half outside the mall, you can move to a location completely outside the mall, which is perhaps going to be a cheaper rent. On the other hand, of course, then you have the uh, you know then you have the problem of the moving expenses all over again. Or, or, of course, you can improve customer service, which may increase your reputation. So there are many different possibilities, all non-programmed decisions, to try to improve the profits and improve the business. And there are many different influences on decision-making. Political forces, this is especially true in you know, energy companies, things like that, where the government uh, may be getting involved in, in you know, renewable energy, non-renewable energy, clean energy, that sort of thing. Intuition, where you're just simply not sure one way or the other whether something is going to work. You can try to use your business judgment to figure out whether it's going to work. Increasing your commitment, you know, increasing the desirability of your location, the, uh, you know, how nice your restaurant looks. Risk propensity, how risky is this decision? Ethical decision making can certainly be an issue. Do you want to be in, in? Do you want to do something in a way that maybe sacrifices a little bit of profits, but puts you, you know, improves your reputation as an ethical company? Coalitions. Can you build partnerships with other companies that have similar goals? Satisficing. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe a typo in there. Anyway, bounded rationality. Are you making d rational decisions for your particular industry, for your particular business? And here are some of these details. Intuition is an innate belief about something without conscious consideration. It's a little bit difficult. We all 
know what the word intuition means just from the vernacular, uh, where you just have a sense that one is going to sell better than the other, even if you have no empirical data to prove it. Risk propensity, of course, you're likely more likely to take uh, a manager is more likely to take a big gamble and will make decisions very differently than a more conservative manager. Uh, a decision, a escalation of commitment is kind of redoubling on a decision, even if it looks bad in in the short term. Individual ethics are personal beliefs of the manager or the people running the company about right and wrong behavior. And of course, there are political forces which could come from outside of the company that could make it more or less friendly for your particular business in the political environment. Chapter 5 is Entrepreneurship and New Venture Management. Entrepreneurship is essentially the process of building a new business from scratch with your own capital, your own investment, or borrowing the investment or getting other investors. The point is you're starting a brand new business. So entrepreneurship means planning, organizing, and operating, and assuming the risk, which is maybe the most important part of being an entrepreneur, of the business venture. An entrepreneur is, of course, a person who engages in entrepreneurship. The person who starts the business, the person who takes the risk, that is the entrepreneur. A small business is anything that is owned by an individual or a small group of individuals. Of course, a small business could later on become a big business. Uh, you could have a lot of sales. A small business could have millions of dollars in sales, but if it's owned and run by one individual or a small group of individuals, then you're talking about a small business. So small businesses, of course, have a strong effect on innovation, job creation, and servicing big businesses. Mature economies and even emerging economies, which means economies that are kind of still developing, depend on small businesses. In fact, small businesses are really, they say, at least the politicians love to say, that that's the engine that, that drives the economy. Then you have big businesses, which is the counterpart to the small business. Big businesses have 20 or more employees and have the resources, infrastructure, and capital that smaller businesses don't have. And therefore, they can make riskier decisions. They can start new markets, new factories. They can buy and build new big uh, projects because of the fact that they have more resources and they have more diversification. Even if they mess up in one area, whereas a small business might not be able to lose a million dollars on a venture and still be okay, if you're a big business and you have 20 million dollars in capital and you lose 1 million you still might be able to function taxes are treated differently than in smaller businesses very often there's a difference between an s corporation and a c corporation s corporation is a, is a small business corporation where the profits are considered taxable directly to the owners as opposed to a c corporation which has its own income tax structure so small businesses also of course have different financial setups than large businesses for a small business needs to make enough money to buy a new computer while a big business uh, doesn't you know have to worry about buying new computers but does have to worry about stockholders and trying to keep their valuation of hundreds of millions or billions of dollars intact and growing them. And both small and big businesses rely to one degree or another in entrepreneurship. Small businesses serve, serve as suppliers to large companies. Services, raw materials, other supplies, you know, if you have a big business like Google or Microsoft or uh, IBM, they might need to buy parts and might need to buy services from much smaller companies in order to keep them going. Temporary accounting services, things, law, law services, you know, they may have to hire law firms to help them go public or to help them defend on lawsuits. These are all ways in which large businesses can rely on small businesses. So big businesses produce most manufactured goods that are sold through small businesses as well. If I own a, you know, a hardware store, well, I don't sell my own products that I make in the back room, generally speaking. What do I do? You know, I buy light bulbs from General Electric, and then I turn around and sell it to consumers. I buy tools from craftsmen, and then I turn around and sell it to consumers. You know, I buy automotive parts, and then I turn around and sell it to consumers. That sort of thing. In other words, I... As a big business, order from, excuse me, as a small business, order from big businesses and then turn around and sell their products. And so big businesses often can outsource many routine business operations like package, deliver, delivery, and distribution to small businesses. You know, big companies like Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, they might outsource to smaller companies distribution. 
you know, they actually Amazon probably doesn't do a lot of this, but many big companies may hire a company to do its warehousing, to do its shipping. Uh, so small businesses and big businesses are not completely apart from each other. Rather, they very often work synergistically with each other. Business plans is, of course, a fundamental component of any entrepreneurship. This is a document that summarizes the business strategy. It includes the goals and objectives of the business, the strategies, and a plan on how the entrepreneur will implement these strategies. You know, that kind of mirrors the three levels of decision making, the strategic part, the tactical part, part, the strategies, then the operational part, how you're actually going to implement the strategy. Now, when you want to start a new business, you can either buy an existing business or you can start a business from scratch. Each of those has advantages and disadvantages. Buying a, an existing business, of course, costs more. And the large, the new, the, whatever problems the other business had, especially the problems that caused them to want to sell in the first place, you still have when you buy it. But on the other hand, their networks are already established, their customer base is established, their client base is established, and they already have a proven track record. On the other hand, when you're talking about a small starting a business from scratch, you're talking about you have a lot more freedom to choose what you do and how you operate. But, of course, there's more risk and uncertainty. Here is a case study, another one of these. Jane wants to start a new type of fast food restaurant. She'll be f selling breakfast and lunch food, bagels, fish, eggs, whatever. She wants to write a business plan to help her move, move her from her dreams to reality. So we need the three levels. We need the strategic level, the business plan. We need the tactical plan, the strategies to achieve the goal. And then we need the operational plan, in other words, the implementation. So the goal of the business might be to turn breakfast and lunch food into fast, quick, and easy to prepare food that's also tasty and to sell, sell to a large number of consumers. That's the general idea of what they're going to be trying to do. That's, that's the idea. That's the theory. Now, from a tactical perspective, here's an example. Uh, have a large, efficient kitchen, have enough capable employees, have financial bank, um, backing, uh, set up a service area that's pleasant, tasteful, and efficient. These are the ways in which she's going to make her money. And then you have the operational goals. The operational goals are the ones where you uh, apply the tactics and actually use the tactics and put the tactics into effect. She'll hire a chef. She'll design the kitchen to have multiple cooking stations to make sure that you can prepare food staff. She'll invest in you know, state-of-the-art kitchen equipment. She'll set up the area. She'll hire a designer to set up an area in a way that customers will like. That's an example of the operational component of her business. Now we're going to move on. The last section of the chapter is financing options. Where do you get your money? Okay, you want to start a business, whether you want to open up a restaurant or develop a new product, you need to have financing. You might have to have only a little bit of financing if it's something like, uh, you know, setting up an e-commerce store may not cost that much uh, because you can only, you just really need to develop a website. Uh, some, if you're developing a drug in the pharmaceutical industry, you might need uh, $200 million in, uh, in financing to, to develop the product. So financing options obviously can vary very, very widely. What are some options? First of all, you got personal resources. If you happen to have money, even you know, depending on how much you need, you may be able to use some of that money to finance your own business. You can go to venture capital companies or hedge funds, which are a group of investors who provide funds to small, high-growth potential startup firms in exchange for a position in the firm. In other words, for a percentage of the ownership in the firm. Big companies like Facebook, you know, when they started, uh, very often they got some money. I think Facebook got some money from Peter Thiel, which was uh, who owned a hedge fund or ran a hedge fund in, uh, in, in San Francisco area. And they put money into the startup in exchange for a certain percentage of the company. You can also establish strategic reliances with bigger companies who can give you the capital or can lend you the capital so that you can, uh, you know, in exchange, they get something in exchange, maybe a part of the company, maybe a deal with the company, and they give you the capital in which you need to, uh, to run. You also can borrow the money. You can borrow it from banks, investors, government loans. You take out loans. But that's only part of the way. That's really you get the money from somebody else. 
Other ways you can get the monies, the money. Well, the, actually, there are, the things on this slide are, are separate. I mean, you could also sell stock. You can also sell stock to individuals, sell shares of the company, get a partner in there who can invest for you in exchange for part of the company. But in addition, you can get small business association loans. You can get small business investment companies. And what these do is they borrow money from a small business association to loan to the small business. Uh, minority enterprise small business investment companies specialize in financing businesses owned in minorities. You can use money from your retirement account. You can use money from your home equity line. Basically, there are lots of different ways in which you can get money to finance a company. Let's take a look at another case study to finish off the chapter. Bill has an idea to invent a new educational toy for preschool age children in order to produce and market the toy, he needs stable financing. Here are some examples that would apply to Bill. He can use his own money or money that he borrowed from his neighbor. He can go to a venture capital company or a small investor to invest in exchange for a percentage of the company. Uh, this is kind of be like Shark Tank. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's an MSNBC show where people go in and try to ask people to finance their business ventures. Interesting show. Uh, strategic alliances. They can partner up with ABC Toys and Company, which is a manufacturing company. And uh, Bill now has some resources because ABC can help fund the manufacture and advertis advertisements. Lenders, he can take out a loan, he can get an SBA loan, or he can go into his 401k, his retirement account, and uh, use that money to finance the selling of the product and the manufacturing of the product. Chapter 6 is Organization Structure and Design. In other words, how do you organize a structure? How do you establish and run a structure so that it has the most efficient results? Job characteristics, in other words, how you're defining any particular job in the organization, has many different dimensions. It has many different aspects of it that you can look at. You can look at skill variety, the number of tasks a person does, does in a job. When you're talking about an assembly line worker, it might be one. When you're talking about CEO, it might be thousands. Task identity. The extent to which the worker does a complete or identifiable portion of the total job. Is it somebody who just supervises or is it somebody who has something specific that they need to do? The task significance, how important is that particular worker's job to the overall uh, perception or functioning of the company? Autonomy, is a person working directly under someone who supervises their every move or is it somebody who pretty much works on their own? Feedback, does that person's supervisor or does the, if the person has a supervisor, does the supervisor give that person consistent feedback? And of course, growth need. I, uh, I just took out the word strength over there. I don't know what it was there for. The desire to grow and expand their capabilities. That is, res that is their response to these core dimensions. Really, these are the core dimensions. Growth need is just the general idea that people need to grow in terms of their, uh, in terms of these dimensions. Each of these has a lower level. For example, skill variety would be one skill, whereas a higher level would be many skills. Autonomy, a lower level would be a low degree of autonomy. Higher level would be a higher degree of autonomy. So let's take a look at some examples of these dimensions and how their characteristics play out in real life. One example would be a pediatrician, a doctor who treats children. The variety is of course fairly broad, does well visits, immunizations, throat cultures, blood tests, referrals, prescriptions, you know, looking in, people, looking in children's ears, you know, all things that a doctors do. The task identity is also very broad for a pediatrician, the extent to which the doctor does what the doctor is supposed to do. In other words, treat the patient. Now, it has limitations, obviously. A doctor, for example, might have to refer someone to a hospital or refer someone to a specialist if the family doctor or the pediatrician cannot take care of the individual, but it's still pretty broad. Task significance is, of course, very important when you're talking about a pediatrician who has children's health in their hands. Autonomy, of course, if you're talking about a sole practitioner, there's a lot of autonomy. You work for a hospital or a practice, maybe a little bit less. And a doctor does have significant feedback. You have individual patients, and the patients you can very often tell whether they're satisfied and to what extent they are. And each of these aspects has some way to make it more efficient, each of these core uh, characteristics. Skill variety, 
may not be efficient for the doctor to do every single task, so the doctor can hire physician assistants or nurses to do blood tests and throat cultures, routine checks, blood pressure checks, height and weight, filling out the chart, things like that. If a doctor does all that, the doctor's going to be too busy, and the doctor probably isn't going to have a very successful patient. Autonomy. You know, greater autonomy could be good in some ways, where the doctor gets to decide exactly what to do. But on the other hand, it may also be good to get expertise and have decisions made by other people, such as working for a practice or a group. And of course, feedback. <coughs> feedback is important in terms of getting feedback and observing the feedback that you get. Okay, let's take a look next at departmentalization. Departmentalization means grouping jobs according to some level, some logical arrangement. Departmentalization, you have a big company and you do lots of things, you manufacture, you sell, uh, you know, an insurance company might have underwriting and claims and marketing, advertising, follow-up appeals, things like that. And the organizational growth exceeds, uh, excuse me, departmental, so uh, you, need to in, you need to departmentalize and have different people doing different things because the growth may exceed one person or one small group of people's ability to manage the entire thing. So therefore you get other managers and other employees to tend to different aspects of the company. You have functional departmentalization, and you also have product departmentalization. Functional department departmentalization means when you put different departments together that have different functions. You know, you have one department for accounting, and you have one department for marketing, and you have one department for management, and you have one department for sales, and you have one department for customer service. Uh, of course, a big advantage, and every company needs to do this when you get beyond a certain size, a big advantage is increasing efficiency and expertise. You know, you bring somebody who's very good at marketing may not be very good at accounting, so you put the person in the marketing department. You put somebody else who couldn't market but is good at numbers, you put them in the accounting department. You also have product departmentalization. If you produce more than one product, if you're Pro Procter & Gamble and you produce, for example, cheese and uh, laundry detergent, so you put them in separate areas and you, have, you put one group on the in the cheese section and you call it craft and you put one group in the uh, laundry detergent section and you call it uh, Tide or Cheer or whatever it is. In a, you know, this example in a department store like Macy's you have different departments makeup, clothing, shoes, appliances, toys, etc. You also can departmentalize based on customers. Different types of customers have different needs. You could sell to other individual consumers, you can sell to businesses, you can sell to government. You can sell, you can, therefore you can have different departments. Merck, which is a pharmaceutical company, has a section for home care, a section for doctors where they, that they sell to, a section for researchers, a section for government, etc. You can also departmentalize based on location. If you have offices in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles, you're really departmentalizing, handling, having the people in New York take care of the New York clients, etc. Playmobil USA, Playmobil Germany, Playmobil Canada, and Playmobil UK is, of course, an example of departmentalization. And the advantage is each one can get to know his or her locality and market. You know, no two localities are exactly the same when it comes to what the customers expect and what the customers will need. Here's a little chart that gives you really a summary of what we just did. By function, you can have one group for finance, one group for marketing, one group for operations. Product, if you have computer, if you sell computers, printers, and software, uh, and it, rather than having one company or one group do all three, you can have one department that deals with only computers, one department deals with only printers, one department deals with only software. Same kind of company can have one department that focuses on home, one business, one education users, and of course by location as well. And you can do all of, all of these things. For example, you could have one office that is strictly the uh, African location that does marketing. And then you could have one location that does finance for the computer division uh, that sells to home users in Europe. In other words, you can have many divisions. If you're a really big company and you've got thousands of employees, you could have many 
divisions that do subarrangements. So in other words, these are not mutually exclusive. You don't have to either departmentalize by function or by product or by customer or by location. You can pick two of them or three of them or different offices can do it differently. You know, maybe the Africa office is a little smaller, so they don't departmentalize at all. And maybe the Europe office is bigger. So in Europe, you've got a uh, marketing division and an operations division. And within that, uh, you know, then you have an office for computers and an office for printers, etc. Span of management is the breadth, the width of what you manage. Just because you're a manager, you could manage five people or you could manage a hundred people. You could manage one product that's being sold in one location or you could manage all the products that are being sold in 50 locations. So that's the idea of a span of management. How many people will report to each manager? How many subordinates the manager can, can, uh, can manage? Etc. So the number of, you have to look at how many people can this individual market efficiently, maybe somebody with more experience or that's better at it can market more people efficiently. There's no one particular optimal span. There, it, there are many different factors that this is determining, determined based on. Geographic, functional, brand. Geographic, for example, if you, if every, if 30 people work in your office, that may be easier to manage than 10 people that work in 10 different offices around the country. Uh, if you're talking about a brand that does nothing but sell widgets, well, that's the maybe you can manage more people. Whereas if your brand sells 12 different things, maybe you're not going to be able to manage as broad a range of employees uh, as effectively. Also, of course, the fewer number of subordinates reporting to a manager, the greater number of managers management that's required. If you have 100 employees and you have 10 managers, well, then you have one manager for each 10 employees. On the other hand, if you only have five managers, you have 20 employees for each manager. What the company wants to do in general is minimize the number of managers while remaining effective. You'd rather pay five salaries than 10 salaries, but on the other hand, you'd rather have the 100 people who are actually working be more effective than be less effective. So that exact determination is not always that easy to make. So this also determines the shape and structure of the, or of the organization, and it determines how complex and how difficult every individual's manager is going to be. Span of management, as we discussed before, also includes distribution of authority. What task is each individual manager going to be in charge of? An organization needs fixed spans of management to ensure that a single person is in charge of each issue. If one manager is in charge of accounting in the Los Angeles office, well then there really shouldn't also be another manager who is in charge of accounting in California office because the two jurisdictions overlap. Now one could be a supervisor and one could be an underling, but you certainly don't want to have two managers on equal levels that are both responsible for the same territory or the same jurisdiction because then you get competition with, with your, in your own organization, which is not usually a good idea. Authority needs to be distributed also, of course, based on what each manager can handle. If you give a manager too complex a project or too many sub, subordinates to manage, it may be beyond a little bit beyond their skills. And of course, a superior manager in a big company needs to coordinate the efforts of lower, le lower level management. You know, there are, we discussed before three levels of management, higher levels that deals with strategic decisions, middle that deals with technical decisions, and then operational decisions are the, are the lowest level of management. So you do want to make sure that each, if you have multiple levels of management, like you very often do with big companies, that each manager has the, you know, the correct number of subordinates underneath them, of course. This depends on many different factors. Determining the span of management, determining how much each individual is going to be able to manage, of course, depends on a lot of factors. Capability of subordinates. The better your subordinates are, maybe the fewer managers you need. If you have 20 new recruits who don't really know the business, it may be difficult for one person to manage them. Whereas if you have 20 grizzled veterans who are very good and, are, and work by themselves to some extent, maybe one manager can manage 20 people or more even. Level of management. The higher the level, the number of subordinates reduces because the higher level management 
is really looking at other managers. In other words, the higher level management aren't really dealing with a bunch of people on the factory floor. The higher level management are dealing with middle level management, which there are going to be fewer of. As you go up the pyramid, you got fewer and fewer people on each level. And these are the people, you know, the CEO at the very top, you don't want them managing the people directly beneath them because you want them making strategic decisions. You know, you want them focusing their time on researching and making the strategic decisions of the company rather than supervising specifically individuals. It's kind of like the middle management is for lo ma managing the lower management and the, ma the lower management for managing the individual employees, but the upper management is really there to guide the future of the company and make the ultimate decisions as to what happens and how the company is going to succeed in the marketplace. This also is affected by the degree of decentralization which means how tightly controlled is it? Decentralization means it's not as tight, tightly control, controlled. When you delegate authority, in other words, when you give a lower manager the ability to make decisions for you in some areas, you're decentralizing and you're taking some pressure off the manager. The con, obviously, the downside is you really have to trust the person to whom you're giving that authority. If I'm the manager of sales for the entire Northern California, and then I say, okay, you know, I've got a subordinate in San Francisco, and I say, okay, you know what, you decide how to go about making your sales. You know, you decide how many ads to take out in the newspaper. You decide how many clients to visit. You decide things like that. Well, it takes a little pressure off of me, and it allows me to... Uh, can manage more people more effectively because I don't have to focus as much on micromanaging the individual we were discussing, but it still makes I have to make sure that I get that I adequately trust the person to whom I'm giving this authority. And of course it also applies to degree of planning. If the planning is effectively done, then subordinates can make their decisions on their own. If you have if you're very careful to train your lower level employees and your lower level managers more, managers more, well then perhaps you can let them work on their own a little bit more and therefore manage them less. So certainly, you know, investing less in managers and more in training may help, whereas some companies may invest less in training and more in managers. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. You really have to make the decision based on the individual company, which is best. Other things, you know, that's other things besides for capability level of management that uh, that uh, affect the span of management includes physical location, like we discussed before. The the closer you are to your subordinates, the more effectively you can manage them. Very often, communication system. The better the better your communication system with your subordinates is the more effectively you can manage, men, manage them when they're off-site. You know, do you have e easy video conferencing? Do you give them all phones, etc.? Nature of the work. If subordinates perform similar and repetitive work, well, then very often you don't have to manage them that often, that, that specifically. On the other hand, if they have to make a lot of decisions, you may have to review their decisions to figure out whether they're making good decisions. Type of technology. Company that is up-to-date technologically very often will require less management because technology will allow people to do their jobs more efficiently and of course the capacity of the individual. You have to look at your people, your middle managers, even yourself and make an honest determination of how much are you capable of managing. And that's well, those are all factors that you have to look at in your company in determining, you know, how many middle managers do you want to use, how many senior managers, how many lower managers, how many people does each person want to manage, how does that management structure work. As you can see, developing a management chart in a company is an extremely complex process. Chapter 7 deals with a very important aspect of management, and that is managing change. No organization, of course, can be the same forever, or very few organizations can be the same forever, and so therefore change is necessary for any organization, any company to stay competitive, and so we are going to look at some of the aspects that involve managing change. And first we're going to start with the Lewin model for change, named after Kurt Lewin, and there are three steps involved, kind of the thawing out process, the changing, and the refreezing. Imagine you have something that is ice, your business is ice, it's frozen in the 
in the procedures that you've always done. So the first thing you have to do is you have to thaw it out a little bit, you have to unfreeze it a little bit, in order to be able to change it, in order to be able to make changes, in order to be able to mush it around a little bit, so to speak. So unfreezing is the process by which you understand why change is necessary, and to get your company to buy into the fact that change is necessary. Then you actually have to implement the change, and then of course you have to crystallize your change. You have to bake your, or freeze in this case, the change into your business model. Those are the three steps. Making, being aware, making the decision to make the change, then, in, and kind of unfreezing your business and making it a little, more, a bit, little bit more malleable, a little bit more uh, uh, movable. Actually making the change and then recrystallizing your business around that. Let's take a look at a case study before we look at the rest of the chapter. A pair of orthodontists have outgrown their current office because their waiting room is too small, they see a large number of patients, etc., etc., etc. What would this mean in that respect? Well, the unfreezing is coming to grips with the fact that you need a change, explaining to the office staff that a change is necessary. Now, in this case, the people that own the, own the business are the ones that are going to be making the change, but still, the entire company has to buy into the fact that change is necessary. And, you know, it's a little risky to go to a new office, to get to a bigger office, start paying more rent, uh, maybe start hiring more people. It's risky. But nevertheless, you have to establish that your, the people, your key people buy into that. Implementing change, going to a new office, setting up a larger office, maybe hiring more people. And then you go ahead and get used to the new normal. Get used to the new philosophy. Get used to the new way things work. And that's the idea of refreezing. Organizational change comes in a lot of different shapes and a lot of different sizes. It comes in people changing the number of people you have, changing the ability and skills of your people, hiring people with different skills, increasing the performance, hopefully, hiring people who don't, who aren't measuring up to the performance. Perceptions. What do other people, what do people inside and outside of your organization think of your company? What do they expect of your company? Attitudes and values, expectations, etc. Organizational structure and design is also an aspect of change, changing the job design, producing different things, pro uh, producing different services. Departmentalization, if you had just a couple of people running the whole company and then all of a sudden you separated into a sales staff and an accounting staff and a and, uh, management staff and an administrative staff, etc. Supporting relationships, distributing authority among people, coordinating all the different uh, resources you have in the company, Line staff structure, making sure that you have the appropriate management structure. Overall design, culture, managing your people, management your human, re human resources. These are mechanisms by which an organization can change. And also an organization can change by its operation or by its technology. Increasing information technologies, getting better servers, better computers, better internet connections, better communication systems, better equipment, activities, control systems, and resource planning. What all of these things have in common is you're just changing the ability, hopefully for the better, changing what, how your company operates and the abilities that it's able to put forth. So now let's look into this a little bit more deeply, just some of the concepts that we discussed previously. Change, of course, can take place in any area of an organization, and the three, and the, really this is just, it's kind of a, an elaboration on this chart. You can change organization structure and design, adding new departments, adding new offices, adding new products, adding new, uh, new facets of the services that you offer, adding new technology and operations, improving your computer system, improving you know, any system by which information flows, and improving your people, changing your people. I guess people can leave and repla get, get replaced, or you can hire new people to undertake new ideas and undertake new positions in the company. You can also engage in organizational development, which is an effort that's organization-wide, managed from the top, to increase the effectiveness overall. Organizational development is not an individual thing that you're going to do. Organizational development is a process. You sit back and you look over the entire organization and you try to make a determination, you know, where could we improve? 
you can use behavioral science knowledge. Some young people you can bring in people who don't have a, don't have a business background but have a psychology background or have a uh, behavioral science background, just to kind of take a, a holistic view of the entire company. This, of course, assumes that the employees have a strong need to be accepted by others within the organization. Individuals will influence the organization. What this means in English, I mean, it sounds like, you know, psycholo psychological uh, uh, babble, babble but, uh, but what it really is is, that is the idea of trying to grow a spirit of growth in your company, uh, where people in the company want the company to develop and want the company to grow and want the company to change and improve over time. That's the, the, the concept of organizational development. And of course, there are, very, there are a lot of very different specific techniques you can do. You can diagnose diagnostic activities of the organization. Sometimes, you know, you have people, you have experts that come in and, and determine how well you're working with each other, how well the, you know, the company's people like each other, how well they cooperate with each other. Life and career planning and setting goals for individuals. If you motivate people to improve their own lives, you're also going to be motivating them to do better in their own business in order to have, you know, to make more money and to be more successful. Coaching and counseling, team building, third party peacemaking in the company if there are any disputes. Process consultation, which means facilitating a group to help deal with issues in, that are relevant to the process of the decision making in the company. Are you looking at, you know, how does the company make a decision? Does the company make a decision because the CEO thinks of it and that's that? Or does the company make a decision because somebody comes up with an idea and it's, it's, it's referred to the appropriate departments and the appropriate number of meetings are held and, and it's thought about and considered and studied and gamed? And, of course, feedback. Feedback from the other people in the company to make sure that whatever the company is going to do, you give an opportunity of the other members of the company to look at it and give their suggestions. So let's take a look at a case study here. We've got Casey, the star of our case study number eight, is a leader of an army finance company with about 80 soldiers in her unit. They, of course, deal with other units. They deal with all sorts of things, all sorts of issues. You can imagine what military people uh, deal with sometimes. Things, things can get very tense, obviously. So, and we've got the soldiers, of course, are generally in the early stages of their careers. So, obviously, this is not a company in terms of making money, but it is an organization. And we're going to look at some of these, you know, organizational development techniques, how they might apply in our case. So, let's take the first one, life and career planning and goals. What can you do to help the soldiers uh, with their career planning? You can bring a person, a career coach, a therapist, or whatever, to meet the soldiers individually and help them understand what it is they want out of their work, what it is they want out of their lives. They'll, it'll, this could be very beneficial to the soldiers. It'll help them stay focused on what it is they want. Coaching and counseling. You can coach them individually, counsel them individually to try to help them improve themselves, help them improve their attitude, help them improve their work ethic. Team building. You can create buildings and projects that foster teamwork. That, I mean, corporate trainers very often do team building exercises where they give you puzzles or they give you something to work with and the only way to do it is to have multiple people working together. Third party peacemaking, where you could have like arbitration or mediation and outside parties trying to solve any disputes within the organization. Process consultation, consulting with the soldiers to make sure that if there are decisions made, their decisions in consultation. Now, this doesn't work so well in the military because in the military you, you have one person making the decision and that's, you know, pretty much it. You don't have that much consultation as you do in business, but still it applies. And, of course, survey feedback, where you try to get feedback from the people in the unit to try to see, you know, what it is they think you could be running differently. It doesn't mean necessarily you're always going to listen to them or always going to do what they say, but it is good to hear the feedback from the people that you're managing to ensure that you don't leave any good ideas on the table. Next, we move on to human resources. These are the people that actually do the job. You may own the company, you may manage the company. These are the people that are actually doing the work that you're managing. You're telling them to do the work and you're hopefully facilitating their work and hopefully uh, doing what you can to motivate them doing to do good work. But these are the people that actually do the work. These are your human resources from the people on the assembly line all the way up to the lower and even upper level managers. One important thing that you need to know if you're managing human resources is you need to know what the law compels you. 
fact, there was the National Labor Relations Act that was passed way, way back under President Roosevelt during the New Deal, and it set up procedures for establishing unions, and it also set up the NLRB, or the National Labor Relations Board. And there were other laws that were passed later on, the Taft-Hartley Act, but essentially what these rules are, and the thing that managers have to know in general, is that there are laws that protect the employees' rights to negotiate. A union is when a bunch of employees, whether it be in one company or many companies, get together and negotiate with the, you know, with the management of the company for higher wages, higher benefits, etc. The company doesn't necessarily have to give them, and uh, you know, companies don't always necessarily have to deal with the unions. Some companies like Walmart are famous for refusing to deal with unions. But the employees have rights to unionize. If they want to get together and say, listen, we're walking off unless you give us a raise. We're walking off unless you, you know, we're quitting or we're working a few hours unless you give us better benefits. There are all sorts of federal and also state laws that protect their right to negotiate with management as a union. So it's very important to understand that these kinds of laws do exist. Now, an affirmative action plan is an interesting uh, idea. The affirmative action plan is the idea of giving certain advantages to minorities who are underrepresented. For example, if a company or an industry, uh, maybe let's say 20% of the people in the area are minorities, but only 5% of the people in the industry, uh, uh, working in the industry are minorities, an affirmative action plan, which is voluntary, it's not forced, uh, would be where the company would say, okay, you know what, we're going to give a little bit of a preference to minority applicants in order to diversify our workforce a little bit. That, you know, some schools do that as well, but companies and government agencies sometimes do that in addition. So affirmative action is a management tool that's designed to ensure employ in equal employment opportunities to try to kind of level the playing field. You know, if people of a certain race were disadvantaged in the past because they were discriminated against, so you kind of level the playing field a little bit by giving them a little bit of an advantage so that they can get back on equal terms with the people who are already entrenched in the industry. The federal government, and some state governments as well, also have affirmative action plans. Executive Order 11246, for example, required federal contractors to develop affirmative action policies. Affirmative action policies that, you know, there were sometimes in, in federal law that, or in federal uh, regulations or state regulations that said that a certain percentage of jobs have to go to minorities. Those, by and large, were struck down by the Supreme Court, but the federal government, state governments, schools, very often do have preferences for minority groups or minority-owned firms in order to try to level the playing field a little bit, in order to try to get a representative sample of minorities in that area. So uh, reaching affirmative action goals, companies can't specifically you know, set a target of a certain number of minorities, but they can have kind of unofficial goals. Uh, com some companies don't, it's not, it's not even necessarily just based on race. It could be in gender, it could be on disability. An example here, stores like Target and Walmart can train and hire people with Asperger's or high functioning people with Down syndrome, whatever. People who would have disabilities also sometimes are the beneficiaries of this type of program. Okay, uh, then you have the process of actually getting the people, getting the employees, and that, of course, is recruiting. Recruiting is the process of getting the proper employees, getting people to work for your organization, figuring out who you think would be appropriate for your organization and who would work best for your organization. You can you can recruit from inside your company, that's internal recruiting, or you can try to recruit from outside your company, that is external recruiting. Internal re recruiting means promotion from within. The good part about that is, well, people have a higher morale if they think there's room for advancement. You know, other people think, okay, you know, if I do a good job, I can also be promoted. It also reduces turnover. Fewer people are going to leave to, fire, uh, to find higher level positions if they can get higher level positions within your own company. And that way you get to keep your best people by promoting them rather than losing them to other companies. The problem, of course, is, is that then you have to fill the lower level positions. And because you don't have as wide a variety of people to choose from. If you have five people in your organization, uh, you know, you might have only them to choose from to promote. Whereas if you sent, if you solicited resumes, you might get uh, thousands of resumes that you, or hundreds of resumes that you could choose from. 
External recruiting means attracting people from the outside. The advantage, of course, is that you have new ideas, new people coming in that might have new views on what you're doing and new explanations. And the disadvantage, of course, is that you don't know as much about them. You're taking a bigger risk. You know, somebody in your organization that's been working there for five years, you know them. You know they're good employees. Somebody that you're, you know, just starting with your company, you never really know about them. Then you have the idea of forming unions. Remember, union is an organized process made by the employees to try to help improve their negotiating position with management. And so the first thing you do in order to is generate interest. Try to get the employers interested in forming a union. You can collect signed authorization cards, and then you can petition the National Labor Relations Board to hold an official election in order to establish an official union. The people vote. The employees all have a right to vote in a secret ballot. They don't have to say what their vote was. And then eventually, if the labor contract, is, if you actually establish it, then you negotiate with management, and that is called collective bargaining. You sit down with management and you say, okay, you know, we want a $2 an hour raise, and we want better health care, we want this, we want that, and management can say no, and then you go back and forth, and hopefully, eventually, you come up with some sort of a settlement. If there is a dispute, unfair negotiating practices, uh, retaliation against union members, which is illegal under federal law, you can file a grievance with the National Labor Relations Board. What about compensation, which is why people work? You know, if you have employees, you have uh, human resources, those humans are going to want money. Well, you can pay them wages, which is hourly compensation, or you can pay a salary, which is, you know, a yearly compensation, something like that. Somebody who works a lot of hours may want hourly compensation, whereas some, if you want security, salary might be better. You can also have incentives, which are compensation opportunities tied to performance. Something like, you know, a sales commission. If the more you sell, the more money you make. You know, people that get paid based on tips. Also, that's kind of a, an incentive structure. That, that's just some, just some different forms in terms of how employees get compensated. So that's the general human resources of the country, of the company. Now let's look at the individuals and look at individual behavior. After all, companies' employees are made up of individuals. And individuals, primarily, the first thing you've got to look at is character traits. There are a lot of character traits that every person has as a manager in determining whether somebody is a productive employee, determining whether somebody is an asset to your organization. One of the things you need to do, you have to analyze the person's performance, obviously, but you also have to analyze the person's character traits. Does the person have traits that make the person more likely to be cooperative and an asset to your organization? Some of the things that are positive, agreeable, and cooperative, extroverted, working with other people well, open, honest, confident, dedicated, magnanimous, which means generous to people, practical, you know, not necessarily head in the clouds, making decisions that are based on real life, positive emotionally, conscientious, etc. And, but then, you also have to realize that some of these, tra any trait that you have too much of can cause problems. Very conscientious, someone who always thinks about things too deeply can develop obsessive compulsive disorder. Someone who's too agreeable and always wants to agree with everyone and just, you know, lick the boots of the, of the supervisor, you know, may have not generate new ideas and may not generate new opinions. Too confident could be too haughty and too much of a big shot. Someone who's too positive emotionally, always smiling and always thinking everything is great, may not be in touch with reality. Someone who's too open and extroverted may talk too much and tell other people secrets that they shouldn't be they shouldn't tell. Somebody who's too magnanimous, who's too generous, may not realize that you know when you're dealing with the company's dime, you may not be able to be so generous. The idea is that positive traits are great, but all traits are good in moderation. Next you have perception. A perception is the process by which a person becomes aware and interprets the information about your environment. Everybody has some level of perception. Everybody perceives their environment. Some people do it better than others. But how a person does this method of perception, how a person perceives their environment and interprets their environment, goes a long way to determining how effective the person is going to be in working and in managing. 
For example, people stereotype. Stereotyping means categorizing or labeling people based on a single attribute. Gender, race, religion, background, age. That could be a problem, first of all, because it could violate rules. You know, there are rules against, viola you know, against discriminating against people based on race or gender or, uh, or religion or anything to that effect. But aside from that, it could cost the organization talent. If you dismiss someone because of that person's characteristics, you may be depriving the organization the opportunity to have that person's service. Then we have this idea of selective perception. Selective perception is more of a psychological thing, but it's also very important in management because people, and everybody does this, you kind of got to fight against this in order to avoid it, is screening out information that we're uncomfortable with. If we see new, if we really, really want our marketing campaign to work and it's not working, we'll still figure out a way to not consciously pretend that it's working, but you know, look at it in a way that makes it seem better than it really is. One of the most important things a manager can do is be able to see through that and not have their judgment colored by what they want to see and really make an honest determination of what's working and what's not working. And that really segues into creativity. Creativity is the ability to generate new ideas, think of new perspectives. And this is where good managers really shine. Not just doing the same thing you've been doing for the last five years and hope that it'll get better. That's probably not going to work. Creativity means new products, new ideas, set goals for products and services, reward other subordinates who come up with creative ideas, and clearly state, even if you, just because, just be, if this person comes up with an idea and it doesn't work, if you, the punishment is too strong, then people are going to stop coming up with new ideas. If they're shunned or not trusted again because they come up with a bad idea, then people are going to stop proposing new ideas. So ideas that don't work out, you know, you have to feel you have to figure out why they didn't work out and try to avoid the same mistake in the future. But it's not necessarily the person's fault and the person that shouldn't necessarily be blamed for coming up with an idea that didn't work. And of course, an important thing of all managers is, is to clearly state to the employees how creativity and motivation are important in the company and how they're supported by the company. Next, we get to one of the key roles that any manager in any organization has, and that is motivating. Managing employee motivation and performance, trying to make sure that your employees give their all, and of course, give their all in a way that makes them the most effective, or as effective as they can possibly be. Obviously, motivation in general is a very complex subject, and it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. It's the sort of thing where some actions can motivate some people, and other actions can motivate other individuals. So we're going to look at it content perspectives, which looks at the needs and deficiencies of individuals. What factors in the workplace motivate people? Obviously, again, this doesn't apply to everybody in, in uh, similar strokes, but it does generally apply. And we're going to look at different types of perspectives. There's the Maslow hierarchy, the Hertzberg, McClellan. These aren't mutually exclusive things. They could all apply, and, but these are all different ways of looking at motivation and how managers can motivate people. So Maslow Hierarchy of Needs looks at what are the different factors that motivate people. When people are employees, or even in other walks of life, what do they, what causes them to be motivated to do something particu in particular? Here are the different factors. There's physiological, which is the basic survival and biological functions. Uh, you need to survive things like food and shelter. This doesn't apply that much in an employment context, although I suppose if you're looking for uh, employees who have to do jobs in the desert, then giving them water, I guess, would apply. But certainly there's a physiological uh, need that everybody needs to take care of. You need to have food, you need to have shelter, you need to have warmth, you need to, you know, <laughs> all, all the things that are basically necessary to survival. That's the lowest level. That's the, you know, the most basic need. Everybody has that. That's pretty consistent. Then there's security. Security is also a fairly low level of need. It's something, again, that everybody has. Seeking a safe a physical and emotional environment, making sure this is, again, the, the first two so far are not as much relevant to employment, but they're relevant to everybody in everyday life. These are things that everybody needs. Then you have belongingness, experiencing love and affection, and just general, uh, the 
experiencing good feelings from other people and experiencing that you belong to a group and that you feel good about your environment. That, of course, is very important to your employment because no matter how good an employee the person is, if the person feels lousy about the company, they are not going to be motivated to give their A performance. Then you have esteem. Esteem is how a person feels about him or herself. Now we're getting to a much higher correlation with productivity. Having a positive self-image, a person is self-confident, a person has a positive self-image, they're more likely to be able to effectively manage themselves and motivate. The more self-confidence you have, the more motivated you are. If you give up on your own abilities and you don't have confidence in your own abilities, well, then you're not going to be able to perform properly. And finally, the highest level, the top level, is the self-actualization. Self-actualization is the, pr the attainment of your own personal goals and development. That, of course, is very related to employment because people, through their jobs, try to achieve what they set out to do, become CEO of a company become rich, <laughs> uh, develop a new cure for a disease, uh, establish, establish a good reputation in academia. All of these things are part of self-actualization. Here is a pyramid that uh, of Maslow, and again, the most basic level is the bottom level, it's physiology, self-actualization, the highest level. Here are some examples of that everybody has in terms of these needs, and then there are how they can relate to your position at the office. Physiology, which is, again, the basic stuff that you need in order to survive, in general life, that could be food. In work structure, that could mean what your base salary is. You need a certain amount of money in order to live, in order to pay your rent. I mean, maybe not strictly in order to live, but at least to, you know, to earn a comfortable living. Security. In general life, that may be stability. In a business, that may be a pension plan to make sure that you're provided for when you retire. Belongingness, friendship, pretty much at both. Esteem, self-confidence. That could be status in the community or status within the organization. And self-actualization really is you're achieving your personal goals, which could be established through a challenging job, challenging job title, and that's one of the things that people in general want to see in their performance, in their job. Hertzberg, which is again not contradictory to Maslow by any stretch, it's just a different way of looking at things, suggests that people's satisfactions are, or dissatisfaction are influenced by two factors, which are motivational and environmental, hygiene. Uh, mo again, hygiene doesn't, doesn't just literally mean, you know, how clean your hands are, which is what we normally think of the word hygiene, but that's your general work environment. And then you have motivational factors, which is your work content, what you do, what you accomplish, what your, you know, what your goal in work is. So, and the, and making sure that an employee is going to be able to give his or her all, give to work to his or her potential, really it's one factor before the other. The first factor is the hygiene factor, making sure that you have a good work environment, making sure that the work environment is comfortable enough, making sure that the work environment does not interfere with the ability of the person to produce. If it's too hot or too cold or there's not enough food or whatever it is or there's not enough money, that's the, uh, you know, that's the first level. And once you accomplish that and you establish that is the best it can be, then you move on to job enrichment and redesign of jobs to increase motivational factors. You give people things to challenge them. You give people things that allow them to use their talents. Uh, if you have somebody who has a master's in business, business administration and all they're doing all day is making photocopies, even if they have a good salary, they're probably not going to be satisfied. They're not going to feel that their talents are being used. They're not going to feel that they're contributing to the organization in a way that really befits their status. Here are the, I mean, there are some general criticisms of the, of the two-factor theory that, uh, again, it's not representative, but again, I'm not, I'm not so worried about the criticisms, I'm just worried about understanding what this is. Some of the factors include, in the work environment, I'll take the right one first, because the hygiene is the base upon which the work content can be built. Supervisors, working conditions, relations, pay, security, policies, administration, these are all things obviously you want to try to maximize to the extent of the employees, and that's the base upon which the employee's productivity can be built. Once you have that, then you look at the motivational content. 
achievement, recognition, responsibility, advancement, growth. These are all things that you try to maximize once you have that adequate base of a secure work environment. And finally, you have the so-called reinforcement theory. Again, just to reiterate, this is not an argument with Maslow or Hertzberg. This is just an additional way a supervisor can look at you know, if you're sitting around thinking about your employees, are you maximizing them? Well, you can look at the Maslow's hierarchy. Are we giving our, all of our employees the maximum level that we can on each uh, factor? And you can look at the uh, then um, at Hertzberg and see, do, you, do they have an adequate work environment and do they have an adequate content? Now let's look at reinforcement theory. The reinforcement theory is the idea that the reinforcement coming from the supervisor has a tremendous amount of influence on the motivation of an individual. Now, this is not any <coughs> great uh, new theory. I mean, it's fairly obvious in some way, but this is a way to express that. Behavior that's rewarded is likely to be repeated, and behavior that's punished is less likely to be repeated, especially if the employee wants to keep his or her job. So there is positive reinforcement. There's negative reinforcement. There's avoidance. And then there is extinction. And let's look at each of these individually. Positive reinforcement strengthens behavior with reward or positive outcomes after a desired behavior is performed. You make a certain amount of sales in a month, you get a raise. You come to work every day for, uh, for six months and you get uh, a bonus. Uh, you know, you finish a project, you know, you get a day off, whatever. Some sort of reward that gives positive reinforcement. Then there's avoidance, which strengthens behavior by avoiding unpleasant consequences that would result if the behavior is not performed. These are This is the function of rules. I mean, it seems fairly similar to... Uh, to punishment. You know, punishment is you take a, take a vacation day off or away or dock somebody money or dock somebody a benefit because they did something. Avoidance is really on the policy level. The Avoidance is obviously preferable to punishment. If you have a rule saying you're not allowed to come late because if you come late you get docked a day's pay, well then hopefully the person won't come late and then you won't have to bother with the punishment. And if the person does come late, then you do have to reinforce it with negative reinforcement. The alternative is you can not reinforce the behavior or ignore it. If a person makes a suggestion but makes a suggestion in a way that's, that is not researched properly, you can fail to, uh, to adopt the suggestion. It's a much weaker, much more passive way of reinforcing, but it still can work. And again, these things are not mutually exclusive. You can do one, both, or two, or all four of them in different ways within an organization. Reinforcement also, you have to look at the timing. Is reinforcement consistently done? You know, every day is there feedback? Do you tell someone you're doing a good job or you're doing a bad job or you get extra money or you get less money? Or do you have, you know, monthly reviews or weekly reviews or biannual reviews or annual reviews? I mean, the, at, at some point you have to also establish not only what sort of feedback you're going to give your employees, but also how often you're going to give this feedback. It can be fixed intervals, such as periodic reviews of the employee's performance. It could be variable, which means there's no particular fixed feedback schedule, but whenever an issue comes up, you speak to the employee about it. Or both, of course. I mean, you could have both monthly reviews and the boss can speak to, this, to the underling anytime something comes up and reward or punish based on the employee's conduct. And then you can have similar is a fixed ratio or a variable ratio. Ratio and the difference between interval and uh, interval and ratio is that interval means a particular period of time, whereas ratio means a particular number of behaviors. For example, if the issue is lateness at work, you can evaluate. You know, a, a fixed interval would be evaluating uh, how many times the employee was late every month. Variable interval would be whenever the employee is late, go speak to the employee. Fixed ratio says something like, okay, you know, if every time you're late five times, you lose a day's pay or you lose a vacation day or whatever. Variable ratio, again, is something that the, the supervisor has to make a determination how many times uh, it should have to happen before it's mentioned. But all of these things, here's a little uh, 
chart over here, fairly obvious. Again, ratio is based on frequency, how often it happens. You could give the feedback or give the reward or punishment after a fixed number of times or after a number of variable based on the circumstances. And you can look at it based on time. And the feedback could be based on a fixed interval or a variable interview. Interval, excuse me. Let's take a look at our ninth case study as we come close to finishing up the chapter. You're a supervisor from one of the plants of a chocolate producing company. I'll say Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Among your responsibilities are to make sure the facilities are clean as well as to ensure the quality of the product and that it meets your standards. Okay. You need to create different reinforcement schedules. Here are some examples. At the end of each day, you praise those workers who worked extra hard to keep the place neat and clean. Well, the reinforcement schedule, of course, that would be time, fixed interval, right? That would be this box over here, whoops, because that's every day. It's once a day. And in terms of, uh, where were we over here? That, that would be positive reinforcement based on the reinforcement theory. During the day, at various points in time, praise those who remember to keep the factory clean. That would be an example of variable interval, of course, because it could be at random times. Give a bonus at the end of the week to a few workers who produce chocolates that met the standards. Okay, weekly, so you're talking about time and you're talking about fixed interval once a week. And when it comes to, to theory, you're talking about positive reinforcement because you're giving um, benefits to a particular person. If the worker leaves a mess at the end of the day, give a warning a few days in a row, give a warning that the place is not neatened up, the worker will require to stay after hours to cleaning, the me cleaning a mess. That, of course, when it comes to theory, is avoidance. You're just making a rule. You're not actually doing it yet. And if you actually do it, it would be punishment. And in terms of schedules, you're talking about, uh, let's see, what, what was the case? If, he, if the worker leaves the workstation a mess for a few days in a row, so you're talking about frequency, and you're talking about a variable ratio, unless you define a few as exactly three, then it would be a fixed ratio. But if a few means, you know, three or four or five, then it would be a variable ratio. And finally, if the workers don't produce quality work, ignore it and hope that the quality will improve. And if it does not, let the workers know that, they will, that their pay will be taken off, taken off if there's too much slack. Uh, that doesn't really specify the time, but in terms of reinforcement theory, that starts with extinction, which is just kind of weakened by not giving positive feedback. And then at the end, if it doesn't work, then resorting to punishment. Like I said before, these things are not mutually exclusive. And finally, forms of work uh, arrangements. How? What are the timing schedules that people very often work? Well, you can compress the work schedule. You can work a full 40-hour week in less than five days. For example, if somebody doesn't like to work on Fridays, well, then theoretically you can have the person work 10 hours a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I mean, the typical work week is assumed to be 40 hours, eight hours a day, five days a week. It doesn't always work like that. Some people uh, work more than 40 hours a week. Some people work less, obviously. But that's the general theory. You can have a flexible work schedule. You can say, you know, you have to work 40 hours a week, but you can work when you like. If you want to work 1 to 4 a.m. on Tuesdays and take three hours off in the middle of the day to compensate, that's fine. You have a 980 schedule, one full week and one compressed week, resulting in one off day every other week. For example, you can do five days a week, eight hours, and the next week, four, hour, four days, 10 hours each, and therefore you get one off day. You can do job sharing, where each you have two different workers who maybe only want to work part-time each. They want to be home, whatever. And they each they split the job, essentially. And you can do telecommuting, more and more popular in today's day and age. In the old days, you wanted to work with someone, you really kind of had to be there, <laughs> because otherwise it was just very difficult for, for, them, for people to realize, you know, to, to work together. Well, today, you can use the phone, you can use Skype, you can use email, you can use video conferencing, teleconferencing, you can use various really good methods of collaborating, and so theoretically, you can really work from anywhere. may not necessarily be the same, same as being there, but telecommuting can certainly work, at least to some extent. Leadership, another very, very important role of any manager. You hear that term thrown around all the time, even though it's a little vague. The person's an effective leader. The person's an ineffective leader. You know, I just saw an article in the Wall Street Journal today that Amazon.com uh, reported 
poor quarterly performance, and now all of a sudden people are starting to question the leadership of Jeff Bezos, the uh, the CEO of Amazon, uh, even though for years and years he was considered one of the best leaders in the world. But all right, that's that's uh, that's a different story. But the point is, leadership and influencing your employees is a very important role for any manager. A leader is a person who can influence the behavior of others without having to rely on force. Just saying to everyone, if you do a bad job, you're going to be fired. Uh, I mean, that's, I guess, one way of running a business, but it doesn't really show leadership. Leadership, a good leader at least, is someone who can ex inspire others to do good work without just threatening. Uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, management is not a manager is not necessarily a good leader. I mean, here's an example. Creating an agenda of what the company is going to do. A manager may just plan, budget, allocating resources. Man, that has to be done. Somebody's got to do it. But a leader can establish the vision for the company, can establish its overall goals. Manager, I mean, you can be both. You really should be both. If you're a good manager, you should be hopefully a good manager and a good leader. Or you can bifurcate. You know, you could have one person who's the manager, who does the nitty gritty, does the budgeting, does the uh, you know the resource the resource planning. And then you could have another person who creates the agenda, who's the visionary. So you could have one person be a leader and one person be a manager, or you could have one person fill both roles. And although that person really should have both skills, manager is more nitty gritty, facts on the ground, making sure that things that things are working properly. Leadership is more of the overall visionary, developing a human network. So a leadership, a leader, can align people through communications, inspire people, talk to people. Whereas the manager, the management role, I should say, is more organization, trying to make sure the staff is properly organized. Executing plans, again, a leader can does that by motivating and inspiring sati and satisfying needs, producing su successful change. And again, you can see, see this chart over here, but the, the overall idea is a leader gets other people to work in the most efficient way possible. Manager puts them in the position where they can most efficiently work. It's, they're not mutually exclusive. You, they need both. In order to run a successful company, you need both. You have management with no leaders. Everybody will be in the position to do their jobs properly, but won't know what their jobs are or won't be motivated to do their jobs. If you have a good leader and no manager, well, then everybody's motivated to do their jobs well, but they don't have the tools to do their jobs well. Each of them are equally important. Power of a leader is the power to affect the behavior of others. You can have power granted through the organizational hierarchy. For example, you give somebody the authority to give employees raises. Well, now they've got the power to influence other people's employees. A person has the power to fire an employee. Well, that's also a legitimate power. You've got power of leadership. You can also, of course, give the power to give and withhold rewards. Now, the type of power people have can be looked at in different ways. The one that we think of most often is the coercive power, the, the ability to force obedience by some sort of a threat. You can fire someone, and threat or reward, of course, but if you do a good job, you get a raise. You don't do a good job, you get fired. That's an example of coercive power. You have the power to make pleasant or unpleasant consequences for people. And because of that, people listen to you, really, because they have no choice. A leader, a really good leader, might have other sources of power as well. Referent power, which is based on identification, imitation, loyalty, charisma. In other words, this is the idea that people like the leader and want Excuse me. Um, uh, okay, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought for a second there. I had to pause it. Uh, so referent power is where, because a leader is charismatic, because a leader is able to uh, inspire others just by natural charisma, because people want to follow that person. The person seems competent. The person seems able. And the person, you know, the people buy into, you know, in sports they call it buying into the person, the coach's vision. And that's referent power. It's something that you can't really force other people to accept. You just have to develop it through your own skills and talents and charisma. Then you have expert power. Expert power is the idea where people want to follow you because they think you really know what you're talking about. Not just a matter that you're charismatic, but people say, oh, you know, that person has a PhD and this and that and the other thing. You know, we think that person probably knows what he's talking about and therefore we'll listen to what that person says. 
And then you have the idea of impression management. Impression management is when a leader tries to maximize the effectiveness of his impression with his or her employees. So the idea is you want to try to improve not just your reputation, but you want the people working under you to like you, to respect you, to fear you, to, to have all the reactions to you that are necessary for you to really effectively manage someone. Impression management is the direct and intentional effort by someone to enhance his or her image. Obviously that's good, because if you have a good image, then people will try to perform their best. And if you behave well to your employees, the, the employees will try to perform for you and will behave better towards you. On the other hand, if you get caught with impression management, if you get caught doing phony things and doing uh, things that are disingenuous just for the purpose of improving your reputation, people may think you're uh, you're being phony. And instead of employee, this would probably be the manager. So I'm going to change that here. The person's so busy trying to impress that you forget what's really important, which is the managerial structure and what it is that you're doing, you know, accomplishing the goal that you're doing. And you can also, if you're too nice to people, you may let them get away with performance that is inadequate. And also, if you're always trying to be a nice guy, well, then the employees might think, oh, listen, he's really or she's really accommodating. I can afford to take off a couple of days of work without a good excuse just because the employer will try to, and the, the manager will try to be such a nice person and let me get away with it. So obviously you have to have a mix between being tough enough and also, you know, putting yourself in a position where the, where the employees respect you and want to work for you. And if they like you, I guess it's even better. Communication, the next subject, the subject of chapter 12, is of course always critical. Communication, without communication, managing is irrelevant. The whole idea of communication is to communicate to the people that work under you how to most effectively do their jobs and what is necessary. So communication means any process of transmitting information from one person to another. And the effective, the goal of communication, the goal of effective communication, is to Make sure that you convey the message in the way that makes the recipient understand what the message is. So they receive communication as close as, com as possible in, in meaning to the message intended. If you say one thing and the employee hears another, for whatever reason, regardless of who f whose fault it is, it will be a... Uh, it will be ineffective, and you won't be a very effective manager. Now, communication could be oral, communication could be written, communication could be with a nod of a head or the roll of an, a roll of eyes, could be with an email, fax, or just not saying anything. In some cases, could be communication by implication. Communication can be data, which is facts and figures. It could also be information in general. You know, the market's doing well today. The market's not doing well today. Our customers are happy. Our customers are miserable. Data is how much, how many customers came through the door yesterday afternoon. How much money did we earn last quarter? Oral communication is one method of communication. Obviously, an advantage of oral communication, whether by phone or in person, is that it provides immediate feedback. People can respond, people can understand what you say, and you can try to clarify if you see the person's eyes glaze over a little bit and you see the person doesn't understand what you're saying, you can try to clarify, you can try to explain what you're referring to. It allows individual to determine motion through facial expression, tone, and speed. These are, all, of course, all things that are that are better done with face-to-face -face communication or, you know, over Skype or video conference. Telephone communication doesn't allow you to assess the person's facial expression, although even telephone communication does allow you to evaluate the person's tone and speed. And, of course, there's no need to type. Sometimes it can be quicker. You speak to someone, it can be quicker than, than writing an email. Problem with oral communication, first of all, you can say one thing and somebody hears another. You know, and, and there could be disputes later on as to what was said. There's no record of the discussion. The speaker could forget things, leave out pertinent details, uh, which is why sending an email or a memo may help in some ways because, the, first of all, the recipient can read it again and again. There's less likely that there'll be a misunderstanding because it's all sitting there on paper. So oral communication, obviously you want to mix. You want to do both, but oral communication certainly has its role in management. Nonverbal communication is anything that does not include spoken words. Could be images. 
And this this slide, by the way, when we talk, we're not this nonverbal communication means the other factors. When you're talking to someone verbally, what are some of the other factors that also contribute to the communication? This doesn't mean as opposed to written communication, which is a different uh, you know which is a different thing. But also images, what kind of an impression you give to the other person, what kind of words you're using, are you using words that are harsh, are you using words that are complicated, are you using words that are simple. These are all aspects that are a little bit different from the message that was sent. The setting. Where are you delivering the message? Are you speaking in the manager's office? Are you speaking off-site? You, you know, you're a manager. Do you call the person into your office? Do you go down to the assembly line where the person's working? Do you ask the person out to lunch? These are all things that can impact the seriousness or the perception of seriousness on the part of the recipients. You also have body language. You know, how close to the person are you standing? Are you sitting upright? Are you standing? Are you, are you pacing? Are you walking around? What's your facial expression? Are you smiling? Are you frowning? Are you pensive? These are all things that, of course, can contribute to the impression that the person gets. And certainly if you're listening to communication, that's one of the things you should be paying attention to. You should be paying attention to the body language of the person who made the communication. Communication within an organization includes vertical communication. People who work as subordinates or supervisors of each other. You call in your secretary and ask him or her to do something. You speak to your supervisor. You ask for something. Your supervisor tells you to do something. That's vertical communication. Usually that's in giving orders and receiving orders or in making suggestions and deciding whether to receive suggestions. And then there's horizontal communication, which means communication laterally within the organization, not between supervisors and subordinates, but between managers of different departments or between employees of different departments. Accounting talking to sales, uh, human resources talking to sales, whatever the case may be. This involves persons at the same level or even, this, even on different levels, but that are from different departments. It involves colleagues and peers at the same level talking to each other to coordinate between independent units. You have a meeting between accounting and sales and human resources and management and marketing, and everybody sits together at a meeting to decide the best way to move the company forward, something that's relevant to everyone. It's useful in joint problem solving and plays an important role in communications among people that are in different departments. Barriers to communication is the counterpart, is the thing you have to avoid when you're trying to communicate with your employees or with other people in the organization. Some of these include consisting, con conflicting or in inconsistent signals. You have more than one manager and they're telling the same employees different things. One supervisor says to do anything to make the company happy and the customer happy in a store. And another one says, don't make the customer happy, make money. Well, <laughs> you know, that could confuse the salesperson and they not, may, might not sure how to react if a customer wants a refund and the customer is unhappy if they don't get it. Credibility about the subject. Hmm, well, uh, credibility includes things you may make, you may tell someone someone, but uh, something, but if they don't trust you, if they don't think you know what you're talking about, uh, that might not be a, fe a very effective communication. Reluctance to communicate. Somebody doesn't like to communicate. Employees, underlings, or even managers don't like to communicate or they don't communicate enough. People could have poor listening skills. People maybe hear whatever they want to hear, even though you tell them something about their performance and they don't understand what you're telling them or they don't internalize what you're telling them. Or you could have a predisposition. Somebody could have their mind made up and not want to listen to any other opinions that may be different. Frank walks into a meeting with his mind made up and doesn't want to hear that he doesn't deserve the raise that he wants. How do you overcome these barriers? Well, you can develop good listening skills. You can encourage two-way communication. You can tell your subordinate, if you're a manager, you know, any feedback you have for me, I'll, I'm always, um, I always welcome your feedback. Maintain credibility with your, with your subordinates. Be sensitive to the perspective of your subordinates and be sensitive to the perspective of the person who sent the communication. What can be done? In this chart, we had examples of barriers to communication. Here's an example of some of the things that can be done to try to fix those problems. Well, if there are conflicting and inconsistent signals, the obvious way to, to take care of that is to have all the managers in a particular area 
make sure that they're on the same page have meetings and establish clear guidelines okay you want to make money and you want to satisfy the customer but what happens if the customer is not entitled to a refund but asks for one so you may want to establish guidelines you know if it's a really good customer if the customer if it was a good faith mistake maybe you want to give a refund otherwise maybe not that's the sort of thing you have to establish to the subordinate as well credibility about the subject well, you know, make sure to establish the person in the company with the best background in this particular area to make the decision or make the statements about one particular area. Try to make sure that everybody takes the time to communicate what they need. Manager looking at situations from multiple points of view is a good way to, to overcome poor listening skills. Sometimes poor listening skills basically means that you don't want to hear what the person has to tell you, or you're not interested in really internalizing what the person has to tell you. Trying to establish a system by which everybody considers views, even that are opposite their own, or even that are different from their own, is a good way to overcome poor listening skills, and to try to overcome predispositions. You want to try to keep an open mind. As you can see, a lot about communication really is about keeping it an open mind. Chapter 13 is about managing work groups and teams. Trying to figure out a way not only to manage individuals, but to manage teams. That of course also is a critical skill when it comes to management, especially in a larger company. You're not managing one individual. You might have a team of five or six or ten or a hundred people working on one particular case or working on one particular project. The distinction is that a group is just two or more people that interact regularly to accomplish a common purpose or goal. Could be informal, could be formal, could be a situation where you only have a couple of people that work in the academics of a school or a couple of people that work in the uh, in sales of a small, small store or whatever it is. Uh, and these groups can be a functional group, which are there created to accomplish a number of organizational purposes, which lasts essentially forever. For example, the marketing team of a small store or the advertising team of a small store might be a functional group, or there could be a task group. A task group is created to accomplish a particular range of purposes within a stated time. For example, a store management might create a committee to study the idea of moving into a shopping mall, you know, moving the coffee shop into a, into a shopping mall. That would be a task group. A committee is an example of a task group where you're establishing two or more people to study or accomplish one particular idea or one particular task. Okay, then you have an informal or interest group, which is created by members for purposes that may or may not be relevant to the organizational goals. Uh, people might create a group to, you know, to ask for a raise for the entire, or, you know, a union, or it could be a group that, uh, you know, it could be something as, as, as simple as, as a lunch group that people, people that go to a particular restaurant during, during the workday doesn't necessarily have to be work related. That obviously is less relevant to the company's goals. A team is an interdependent group of workers who function as a unit, much more structural, much more specific than, than just a group. A group may not may have little or no supervision to carry out their, their particular functions. You might put together a team whose goal it is to develop a particular product or to market a particular product or to sell a particular product or to put together a presentation or to, uh, you know, to, to put together a new brochure. Teams can be self-managed. They can be cross-functional. In other words, they can have different tasks and they can work together with different organizations. You can have a high-performance team, which works quickly and efficiently. Obviously, that's a really good kind of team to have. Reasons to join groups, and, and obviously it doesn't necessarily mean if you're the employee, usually you join the group because you're told to join the group, but this really means reasons to establish the groups and reasons to populate the groups with good people from the company include things like interpersonal attraction. People like to work together. Even people who are, in, certainly people who are extroverted like to work together. <coughs> but even people who are introverted very often benefit from working together with other people, bouncing ideas off of people. And that includes group activities. Group activities appeal to people very often more so than just individual activities. You get to work together with people. Human beings are social animals, as they say. They like to work together. They like to deal with other people. Group goals. Group's goals can motivate them to join. A particular group has the, has the goal of increasing sales by 10%. Could be fun. Could be a challenge. Need satisfaction. 
it joins, it fulfills an individual's need for affiliation and that you want to be part of a team. It feels good to be part of a team and work to a common goal. And it also provides other benefits. Maybe everybody in the group will be able to negotiate a pay raise or more vacation or some other perk for the benefit of the entire group. An important element of any group, or really any team as well, is cohesiveness, which is the extent to which members are loyal and committed to the group and the attractiveness within the group. Some things can increasing, increase cohesiveness, togetherness within the group, and some things can decrease it. Interaction. The more you work together, the more experience you have with each other, the easier it is to be cohesive and together with one another. Intergroup competition. If you have groups competing against each other, you have the New York group and the Chicago group each competing to see who could sell the most widgets in their particular geographic area. Favorable evaluation. If the entire group gets a favorable evaluation from management, it makes people feel more together with each other. That they accomplished a, a, they accomplished a good, they did a good job together. Personal attraction. If the people in the group like each other, and of course agreement within the group on the goals of the group. Decreased cohesiveness could apply because the group is too big. Just hard, so hard. You know, a group has 50 people in it. You don't know everybody. You don't work with everybody that well. Disagreement on the girls in intra-group competition. If you have a group and within the New York office, they're fighting each other to see who can get the most individual sales. Like, you know, a car dealership might have five salespeople, but each one wants the sale for him individually or her individually because they're getting a commission. Well, that could decrease the cohesiveness of the group. Domination by an individual or, of course, unpleasant experiences with each other. Performance is, of course, correlated to cohesiveness. Cohesiveness, of course, can also be looked at together with performance norms, how well the company or how well the individuals in the group are doing their jobs. If you have high performance norms, high performance expectations that people will do their jobs and high performance that the people are actually doing their job and high cohesiveness, what you're going to get is high performance. If you have low both, you're going to get low performance. High cohesiveness and low performance norms is a bad strategy because that means if people aren't performing and they get and they you know they get easily distracted with each other and they work together as a group and together do a bad job <laughs> that's obviously pretty bad. You have high performance norms and low cohesiveness. At least you have high performance, so low cohesiveness will be. Uh, it's still you're only going to get average performance because you would ideally love to have high performance norms and high cohesiveness but if you could have one or the other obviously uh, you'd rather have high performance than high cohesiveness so okay let's take a look at a case study of performance uh, and cohesiveness you're a store manager at an outlet clothing store the number of customer complaints is increased mm. you attribute list this to a lack of cohesiveness you need to develop a program to overcome this problem and increase increase the cohesiveness of your staff what can you do based on what we learned in this chapter you can have a bi-weekly meeting with the service staff foster a feeling of togetherness Try to increase cohesiveness by positive reinforcement. Remember some of the, with uh, interaction among the people, favorable evaluation, trying to get them to agree on goals. You can create a contest between pairs of service workers. You know, each pair would be their own team, and that way you're establishing intergroup competition. You're making each two salespeople a group and then having them compete with each other. And it will also, since they're working together towards a common goal to get more sales than the other group, it, you'll, you'll increase sales through that incentive. Write an evaluation for the service staff to fill out and try to make a determination of where these problems are coming in. Get feedback in terms of why there's a lack of cohesiveness. The biggest enemy, of course, of cohesiveness is conflict. That's not to say that all conflict is bad. If there's no conflict whatsoever, it means people are being overly submissive and they're not giving their ideas that differ with management. You don't like to have a situation where nobody gives any new ideas because they're afraid of conflict. You do want some level of conflict, but you don't want too much conflict. You want enough conflict to generate ideas and to have the best ideas win to have a marketplace of ideas, but you don't want too much conflict that people start getting bad feelings of each other and, uh, with each other and don't like each, each other. <coughs> All a conflict means is a disagreement. It doesn't have to be nasty. It doesn't have to be a fight. 
Any kind of disagreement is a conflict. Some conflict is necessary to compete and to establish the marketplace of ideas so that people can give their ideas and give their feedback. Too much conflict causes low performance, and lo too little conflict causes low performance. That's why there's some level of conflict that's ideal. No conflict means no original thought. Too much conflict means bad feelings. Optimal level of conflict is really where people feel comfortable giving their contrary opinions, but don't really make it personal and don't you know, stick with it. And once, once the company has made a decision, they follow it and buy into it. Managing conflicts includes stimulating conflicts in some ways to get the ideas flowing from people. Increase competition among individuals. That was in one of the examples we looked at in the case study where you create groups and try to increase a little bit of conflict between them in order to get their creativity juices flowing. Hire outsiders to shake things up, come up with new ideas, and change procedures. On the other hand, Sometimes you want to resolve or eliminate conflict. Bringing conflicting parties together, confront and negotiating their conf conflict, trying to avoid it. In different scenarios, you have to make a decision as a manager. Does your company have too little conflict, too much conflict, or just right? How can you control conflicts to make sure they don't get out of hand? You can expand your resource base, try to get differing views from different people, and not have to focus on the same two people arguing about issues in every case. You can enhance coordination of interdependence. In other words, make sure that different people from different departments work together and that they know where they're going. You don't want to come in later after the goals are already being worked on and one person says this was a bad idea to begin with. You want the people to give their ideas from the beginning. Set superordinate goals, something that applies to the entire company, and of course match personalities within individual groups and teams and habits of employees. And let's look at one more case study before we finish up the chapter. Susan has been placed in charge of the PTA Spring Festival. Her only concern is that she doesn't know how to deal with conflict. What can she do? Okay, PTA, I guess we're talking about dealing with parents here. So you can divide the parents into separate teams. This will force them to do their best. And you know people do this in, in corporate uh, uh, building experiences. You get different people within the group and you try to help them. Uh, you divide them into teams so that they work together to try to compete and get the best possible outcome. Speak to people before the festival and allow them to vote on decisions in an organized, controlled environment so that each person feels like <coughs> he or she had a say in the matter and wasn't totally powerless. Even if you got voted down, at least you're more likely to accept it if you know that it was a fair vote and a fair election. Match personalities and areas of expertise. Make sure that each group has a well-rounded ability to compete and have the groups de depend on each other. This is an example of parents, but a lot of these same things are used when you're trying to build uh, teamwork within an office. Chapter 14 is about basic elements of control, the basic ideas that managers bring to a company, the basic control that managers have over a company. And the first one is budgeting. Budgeting is setting aside money for particular tasks or for all the particular tasks for a company, establishing how much money the company has to spend and how much money the company is going to actually spend and how much, where that money is coming from. So a budget is really just a plan expressed in numerical terms. It could be financial terms, it could be units of output, anything that's quantifiable. We're gonna, we have to produce 10,000 widgets, we have to uh, produce 10,000 man hours of legal services, whatever. They're typically used for a year or less. You can establish an annual budget, a monthly budget, a weekly budget, a for project budget. Budgets can you know, be established in many different ways. Budgets, of course, help managers coordinate resources and projects, allowing the manager to look at the resources that the company has and the ability to, to to complete projects that are necessary for the company help to find the standards for control how much money is going for each for each group in terms of what the group needs what you know if a group is only budgeted for a certain amount well they may not be able to do everything they want to do to accomplish the goal Budgets provide guidelines about the resources and expectations, how much mon money the company expects to earn, how much money the company uh, expects to spend, and how much of a profit the company needs to make. 
And of course, budgets enable the organization to evaluate the performance. If you see a particular store is producing more money than you expected, that means the sales staff in that store is doing a good job. If you see that the company is spending less than expected, well then maybe the allocations department of that company is doing a good job. So these are budgets. Budgets can be financial. I mean, all budgets, I guess, in one way or another, uh, depend on financial purposes, but budgets can be based on money. Cash flow and cash expenditures. How much are we making? How much are we spending? It could be on the individual project level, on the individual group level, or on a company-wide level. There are operating budgets, which are expenses, profits, and sales and revenue budgets. In other words, not only for the entire company or the entire project, but how much money can we spend on this particular project and how much money do we expect to make on this particular project. Then there are non-monetary budgets. Budgets that are based on space. How many offices do we have? You know, do we need to get a bigger space? How many individuals can we have? How many people can we hire? And of course, the production budget. How much do we need to produce? All of these things are really elements of a holistic budget. I don't, they're not, your company doesn't usually produce three different types of budgets, but a complete budget produced by a company will take into account all of these factors and maybe analyze all of these factors separately and, of course, together as they affect the entire company. Next, we're going to move to audits. An audit is a review of the company's budget or of the company's books or of the company's finance in general. Financial audit is an assessment of the organization's accounting, financial, and operational systems. How, how much is the company making? How much can the company make? How much can the company afford to spend? How much is the company spending? You know what it is? You're looking over the company's books to find out how much the company is spending and how much the company should be spending. In order it can be external or internal. You bring in an outside accountant. You bring in a forensic accountant. You bring in outside people to look over the company's books. Very often you do that when you're looking to buy or sell your company, just like an appraisal when you're looking to buy or sell your house. An internal audit is an evaluation conducted by the employees of the organization. Maybe a little cheaper to do it internally than externally, although of course you may need an external person to try to make sure that everything is done objectively. It's because the advantage of internal, as I just said, is that it costs less. Edits can be removed before the audit is published. Sometimes you do an internal audit, you make some mistakes. Well, you can look at you can look at the numbers carefully and make sure that any mistakes are corrected. It can be constantly updated internally if it's done internally. And of course, the person doing the auditing will be faithful to the company because the person has an incentive to make sure the company is operating properly. On the other hand, that's really the same disadvantage. Only external audits are accepted by shareholders of a company or by buyers of a company for the very simple reason that people who are in the company are biased in favor of that company. External audits are less likely to have mistakes than internal audits because a person in the company is not actually an auditor. And of course, external audits are less likely to make mistakes because the person is in in the company is not actually an auditor. A person, if you hire your accountant or you tell your accountant to go through the books, that person may not be a professional auditor. Professional auditors are usually outside firms that go in to make sure that the company's books are in order. Very often this happens again before a company is going to be acquired by a different company. Strategic control is a little bit different than budgetary control. These are things that focus on control of the company in areas that are not directly financial. This is aimed at maintaining an effective alignment between the environment and strategic goals. Structure, leadership of the company, technology the company used, human resources, who's hired and who's fired, informational and operational systems. How does the company communicate with each other? How do the people in the company uh, cooperate with each other or communicate with each other? And it focuses the extent to which implemented strategy achieves the organizational goals. You're, you want to make a million dollars next year? Okay, well, you know, are the five stores that are open sufficient to make a million dollars? That's a question of making sure that the strategy that you have is compatible with the method in which you're actually operating. Internal strategic control focuses on whether to, whether to manage the global organization from a centralized or decentralized perspective. We want to look at how well can the company manage branches or operations in other countries. Strategic control also varies, of course, whether you're talking about a domestic organization or an international organization. So if you look at the distinctions between domestic organizations, 
Domestic organizations that are focused primarily in the United States are more centralized. It's a lot easier to control the entire operations in one area. Goodyear tires, things like that. You don't have to delegate that much management and control as much as you would if the company has operations around the world. Obviously, if a company does have operations around the world, you have to give some authority to those managers to deal with local customs, to deal with things that are unique to that country, to deal with regulations, to deal with politics, to deal with government that's relevant specifically to that country. And finally, there are some other factors regarding effective control over a company include, include things like integration with planning in order to integrate the conceptual goals of the company with the resources that you already have. That's very important. Flexibility ability to change your plans based on changing politics or changing systematic uh, ideas that happen. <coughs> Accuracy. Getting the appropriate information obviously is something that's going to prevent bad decision making because if you get in wrong information you could make decisions based on that wrong information. Timeliness. Making sure that things are updated as timely as possible. And objectivity. Trying to make sure that your management system is not biased based on preconceived notions. These are some other aspects of control that are obviously go into the equation in addition to the factors like budgeting, the powers that companies have. Let's take a look at our next case study. Ellen has a very disorganized department. Now this is obviously something that's not quite as relevant when you're talking about but is relevant, not as, organ not as relevant, excuse me, to businesses, but of course is relevant to everyday life. Every time she tries to make the apartment orderly, she becomes overwhelmed and loses control of the situation. How might she meet her goal? Well, she might integrate with planning, like she might write, write a chart dividing each room into parts, and that leaves her to organize one small part each day. That's really integration. That's really trying to make sure that each aspect of it is integrated with the plan as a whole flexibility, she leaves some days empty so she has plan time to do other things, and of course accuracy, trying to make sure that whatever her plans are, are doable and will be done. Other things include timeliness, obviously make sure to do it within the objective time frame, otherwise the project gets, you know, gets drawn out for too long and it becomes ineffective. Objectivity. Objectivity includes things like making sure that the appropriate decisions are made on an individual basis, whether to throw something out, when, what to do with each area, and finally monitoring progress, printing out a calendar, making sure to monitoring the progress, making sure to set goals and to meet those goals one at a time. And each time you meet a goal, you know you're making a certain amount of progress. And our last chapter is the important, also important area of managing operations and quality and productivity, kind of a combination of a lot of the areas we've discovered, and that is, or we've, we've discussed. Americans are generally well educated, and of course there's been an increase because of that in the service sector. People that, you know, computer programmers, accountants, lawyers, things like that, as opposed to manufacturing where people on the assembly line don't necessarily need a tremendous number of skills. So manufacturing requires manual labor, not a lot of education, and it really combines and transforms resource inputs, namely labor, physical manual labor, into tangible outcomes, built products. Services require education, but and salaries are higher than manufacturing. And so because of that, in the United States in the last 30, 40 years, there's been a lot more focus on the service sector and less focus on manufacturing, which very often has been outsourced to other countries. A services organization transports, transforms resources, you know, like an accounting firm or a law firm. You have resources which are trained individuals and good computer technology and whatnot, and they have the ability to, to per, put turn that into services for other people. Then there's inventory management, which is management of your organizational materials. Inventory, which is the stuff that you have access to, is raw materials, work in product, and it works in process. Then you have goods that are already completed, but then the last level is where they're actually in transit, where they're actually being moved to the wholesaler, to the retailer, actually really to the wholesaler from the manufacturer, to the retailer from the wholesaler, or to the customer from the retailer. The just-in-time method is an inventory system that has necessary materials arriving when they are necessary. For example, if you have a store, you might not want to stock a thousand uh, televisions because you don't know if you're going to sell them. Rather, you stock them as you need them. 
when one sells out, you stock another, well, not necessarily one, but when 20 sell out, you stock another 20. When another 20, you know, a supermarket does that a lot. You try to stock it within the few days before it's going to be sold. You know, you don't want to stock an extra thousand gallons of milk because they're going to go bad pretty soon. That's the just-in-time method is very important for raw materials and works in progress inventory because you don't want to, you want to make sure that you have whatever you need to continue with the process of manufacturing. The purposes and sources of control are also very important when it comes to resource management. You have the raw materials, which are necessary to make the product. Uh, you know, for a car manufacturer, it might be metal, rubber for the tires, plastic for the door handles, whatever the case may be. Managing the work in progress, which is to enable the production to be divided into stages like shop floor control, control systems, you know, in a, in a store. You could have a store and you manage the, you could have, a, let's say, a car manufacturer again, just to put our example over there, is necessary to divide, you know, part of the company makes the wheels and part of the company makes the doors and part of the company makes the engines and the transmissions. Then you have the finished goods, which is the management is necessary to supply the products to for the purpose of consumer demand. And then you have in transit, which distributes the products to the customers. And that element of managing is managing the transportation and the distribution control systems, the distribution to the next level in the stream of commerce. Again, if you're a manufacturer, that would be the wholesaler. If you're a wholesaler, that would be the retailer. And if you're a retailer, that would be the ultimate customer. Quality control in general means all of the features and characteristics of the product, making sure that it's up to the standards that the company needs to provide. It's a relative and it's absolute concept. Certainly if you're a if you're trying to sell on price, your quality doesn't have to be as strong as it does if you're trying to sell on quality. And it's rele relevant to both products like a car or a stapler or a fan or a wristwatch or whatever it is, but it's also of course relevant to services like legal services, accounting services, things like that. There are many many different aspects of quality. Here are a few of them. There are aesthetics how a product looks, feels, tastes, smells. When you're talking about a car, how it looks. When you're talking about a uh, wristwatch, you know how it looks. All the how it feels, how it smells, depending on the product. Conformance: Does its design meet the established standards? A uh, car seat, baby car seat, you know, needs to be able to keep the baby safe in the event of a crash. In most cases, durability. How long can it be expected to last? Features, you know, what additional features are there? Again, in a car, you could have power windows, power locks, you could have a uh, six disc CD changer, you could have leather seats, you could have a GPS system. These are all things that are optional features. That's part of the quality. Performance, how well does it done? Again, in the case of the car, acceleration, braking, power, things like that. Reliability. How is how likely is it to last properly without breaking and without needing repairs? Serviceability. How easy is it to repair? And finally, perceived quality, which is essentially reputation in the market. Each of these things, and we're discussing it in terms of manufacturing, in terms of cars, but of course it also includes things like, it also, all these things, or most of these things actually would apply when you're talking about a service, uh, service as well. You know, you don't really have a taste for a legal service, but most of these things, uh, work, and most of these things work also when you're talking about services. Quality is managed in total quali quality quality management, which is something where a there has to be a strategic commitment. There has to be a, a commitment on the part of management to make sure that everything that you need is necessary. Everything that you need is received and put to use in terms of the quality. And when you combine pretty much everything, a real holistic view of what the company has done relative to what it's supposed to do is determined in terms of the company's productivity. For example, just in, when you're talking about a country, it's the, the size of its economy is the gross domestic product, which how productive is the country? How productive are the people in the country? There's aggregate productivity, which is the total lo level of productivity for a country. For a company or a country or a company it could be either one. Uh, in our case, we'll call it company because I think that's what applies over here. But these things also apply for when you're talking about measuring the productivity of a country, of a of as well. Company productivity. 
Actually, this slide, it does mean for a country. In other words, you can divide these things based on the individual company. You can look at these things in the aggregate as to an entire country. Industry productivity is the productivity of all firms in the industry. How many automobiles are the, is the American, manufacture, American automobile manufacturing industry making? Individual productivity applies to an individual person, or unit productivity is the productivity level of a unit or an entire department within a company. Productivity could be total factor productivity, which is an overall indicator of how well the organization uses all of its resources, including marketing, including human resources, including advertising, including pretty much everything. Or you can look at just labor productivity. What's the production in terms of product that is produced and sent to consumers? Product that's produced and sent to wholesalers. Product that's produced and sent to retailers. That's a partial productivity ratio that uses only labor to gauge an organization's productivity. Overall productivity in a company is the outputs. In other words, what you pay, what you the efforts you put in, the number of hours you put in, the number of man hours you put in, divided by the number of inputs. I'm sorry, that is inputs. Outputs is what you produce. If you produce a thousand cars and you put in 25,000 man hours, so your, you, so your uh, productivity is one car for every 25 man hours. That would just be an example of an output to input ratio. Labor productivity is also outputs, what you produce, how many widgets you produce, how many cars you produce, divided by the direct labor. And finally, we'll look quickly at improving productivity. Some of the ways that a company can improve productivity, spending more time and money in R&D, research and development that can produce better products. Revamping facilities, getting more technologically up-to-date facilities. In the service sector, a firm, uh, you know, even a law firm or an accounting firm, a doctor's office, hospital, things like that, clients are more likely to be attracted if the facilities look nice. They're updated. Cross-training means training employees to increase the value of whatever their output is. And then you have re restructuring the reward system to try to make sure that employees are rewarded for doing a better job and, of course, increasing employee participation in the process of producing services. And that's the end of chapter 15. So that really concludes our crash course. I think that watching this and going through the uh, PowerPoints that you have access to would, is both very, very useful things in terms of uh, preparing for the final exam. If you have any questions or comments, please let us know. And thank you very much for listening, and good luck.